What if I told you that by the end of this video, you'll have built a full video game that's lots of fun that your friends and family can play and be on a path to building games of any kind that you want in the future? Well, that's the case. It doesn't matter if you know how to build games already. If you have any coding experience, none is required. You don't have to be great at math. You don't have to be some sort of magical wizard or anything else. All you need is access to a computer and a little bit of time and effort. It won't cost you anything, and by the end of it, you'll be on a path to either a new game development career or just a really awesome fun hobby. To start building games, we're going to need to install two pieces of software on our computers. The first is a game engine and the second is a code editor. Luckily though, most game engines just come with a code editor in the installer automatically, so we don't have two steps there. We have two choices when it comes to game engines. Well, technically there are a lot of them, but the primary two choices are either Unreal or Unity. In this tutorial, we'll be using Unity because it's my favorite engine and I think it's the easiest to get started with, plus it's extremely versatile and will let you build just about any kind of game that you want. To set up Unity, all you need to do is go to the main Unity webpage, unity.com, click on download and then choose download for Windows or download for Mac if you're on a Mac. Save off the installer and run it, and that will give you the Unity Hub. When the Unity Hub first launches, it'll probably ask you to sign in with a Unity account or create one. Don't worry, you can just create a free account, and once you've done that, you'll be able to log in and set up your Unity installations. The Unity Hub allows us to keep track of multiple versions of Unity. To set up an installation in Unity, we go to the Installs tab right here. And I already have quite a few different installs of Unity put in here. I've got 2023.1.10, 2023.1.8, and then 2023.1.6. You can see these are all the latest versions from 2023. I also have an LTS of 2022.3. The LTS stands for Long-Term Support or Long-Term Service. And there's one of these for each year which is essentially the version that they recommend you use. That's not the version that I like to use though. I like to use the latest and greatest. And to do that, you hit install editor and then go down to the bottom where it says other versions. You can see that I've got 2023.1.10 F1 installed. And that's the one that I would recommend you grab to or whatever other version is right down here. There are some pre-release beta versions. And of course there are the LTS versions as well. You're welcome to use an LTS. It's just that they tend to be a bit out of date after a while. So I like to use the latest thing. Once you have the Unity Editor installed, it's time to create a new project. You click the New Project button and you'll be presented with a bunch of options for types of games that you can build. In this example, we're going to build a 2D game and we're going to use the latest Universal Render Pipeline. That's this 2D URP option. You could also use the 2D option, it'll work just fine, or the 3D option, but the 3D option will leave you in a slightly different mode by default and there's a couple little settings that you have to change. I'll show you what those are a little bit bit later on. Now that I've got 2D URP selected, I need to make sure that I've got the correct editor version. Since the latest editor version out right now is 2023.1.10 F1, I'm going to select that and we'll use it. Now we need to give it a project name. So I'll go to the project name section. And I'm going to name this Mad Birds 23. I'll leave it in my projects folder. You can put this wherever you want. Just make sure that you remember where you put it. So when you want to go look at it later, you can find it and then hit the create project button. This will probably take a few minutes, especially the first time you create a project, but when you reload your project next time, don't worry, it'll be quite a bit faster. When it's done, you should have something that looks like this. If your look is a little bit different because you've used Unity before and moved things around, that's not a problem. You can always go to Window and Layouts and then choose Default. That'll put you back into this default layout that has everything exactly where I have everything. Let's talk about what those things are real quick. To the top left, we've got the scene hierarchy. This shows us everything that's in our current level. We'll talk a lot more about levels as we go on. Next, we've got the scene view and the game view. These are actually two tabs that we can switch between. We can also drag these off and move them around, but I'm gonna leave this up here for now. Remember, if you accidentally moved something to the wrong place, you can always go to window, layouts, default. I mentioned that the scene and game view are separate tabs, but let's talk about what they actually do. The scene view gives us a visual representation of our entire level. Just like the scene hierarchy will give us a collapsible, expandable view of everything that's in our level, the scene view will show us visually all of our objects. This is where we do our level building and run around our scene kind of in the backside view. 
Now the game view does the opposite. It shows us what the player is going to see or mainly what our primary cameras or our cameras that are enabled see. That's how our players see us through cameras and we're gonna dive into that quite a bit later. Over here to the right, we have the inspector tab. The inspector has absolutely nothing visible because I haven't selected an object. Let's select an object real quick and take a look at what it looks like in the inspector. To do that, I'm gonna go to my hierarchy and you can see here we've had this little arrow and you may have already expanded and collapsed yours a couple times. Underneath it, we have a main camera and a global light. If I click on this main camera, my main camera got selected. You may have selected your light and then you'd see your light being selected as well. Let's go over to that scene view and see what happens in there. Now you can see that I've got these little arrows showing ways that I can move around this light object. I'm not gonna move it around because that's not something we need to do right now, but I wanna make sure that we understand these representations or these associations. If I select this main camera object, it gets selected and shows up in the scene view. If you don't see it in your scene view, just double click on it. That'll focus it in the scene view and give you a nice close shot of it. You can also hold your mouse over the scene view and press the F key to focus or zoom in on the object. You can press F again to zoom kind of back out and get this further away shot. Over here in the inspector, you'll see that I've got a whole bunch of different options. We're not gonna play with all of them right now because there are quite a few, but let's just expand out the rendering section and take a look. You can see I've got lots of different options. And let's expand out the environment section to see what we can do with our background. If I go look at my game view, right now our game just shows this dark blue color and that's our background color. If I wanted to change that, I can choose the background option here and then go select maybe a lighter blue or a white or a green or whatever I like. I'm gonna go with this slightly lighter blue. I'd recommend you go with something similar, but don't worry, we're gonna adjust the background to a full-on image later. So if you pick a color that you don't like, you can always change it. Now you'll be using the inspector a lot in game development, so it's important to get somewhat familiar with it. Let's break down the different pieces of it outside of the camera. First off, it's important to note that our inspector shows us a game object, which is the object selected over here, with all of its components. The components are each of these little collapsible tabs. You see that the camera had these little sub tabs underneath it, those are not components. It's these base level tabs that you can collapse. Each one of these is a component on your game object, and this is what makes up an object. It's what takes an object from being just a static piece of art to being a full-on player character or an enemy or an item that you could pick up, or in this case, a camera that shows our game to the player. Now let's move on to the next section. Down here we have the project view, and the project view shows us everything that's in our project. You can think of this as kind of like a file explorer or a finder window, I guess, if you're in Mac, but it's essentially a folder structure representation of our entire project and all of its subfolders. This is going to have all of the code files that we have in our project in here. It'll have all of the art files, all of the audio files, and everything else that's kind of the core part of a game. If it's in a game, it will be inside your project folder. We can expand out these folders by just clicking on them. You can see I've got a different view here. When I click on these folders, I see this little icon. That's controlled by this slider at the bottom, or I can hold control and use the mouse wheel. Now, the reason that you would want to use that slider and show these bigger images is so that you could actually see graphical representations of things. We don't have anything graphical to show in here yet, but we'll see that in just a moment. The other tab that we have here is the console tab. This is one that we'll use for errors, debugging, and just writing out logs. It can be really useful in development, but not something that we need to dive into to start. Now that we've got a handle on the editor parts, let's start actually building a game. We're gonna begin by switching over to the scene view. Now that I'm in my scene view, I wanna make sure everybody's view looks exactly the same. So if your view looks a little bit different, perhaps like this, where you're seeing a 3D representation of the world, just make sure that you've checked the 2D button. Also make sure that your lighting is enabled just like mine and all of your other settings look about the same. These are the defaults though, so it shouldn't be too difficult. Next, we're gonna create an object. To create a new object, we're gonna use the menu here and we're gonna use the game object menu to be specific. We want a 2D object because we're building a 2D game, and we're gonna start with a simple sprite. We're gonna use a circle and create that right here. You'll see that our circle has appeared in the hierarchy, and our inspector now shows information for a circle. Well, more specifically, it shows a sprite renderer and then a transform, which yours may or may not be collapsed. You also probably noticed a circle appeared right here in the middle of the scene view. Let's go to the game view. 
Look at that, we've also got a circle right there. Now if your circle doesn't look like this, or maybe it's way over here off to the side, or way over here off to the side, you can go to the transform, right click on it, and hit the reset button. That should force the position to be at zero on the X axis, which is the left and right axis, zero on the Y, which is our up and down, and zero on the Z, which is actually our back and forth axis here that we're not using. That'd be this one right here, and it doesn't make any difference if we move our object on that Z axis. You can see if I adjust that value, nothing happens. Let's take a look at if I adjust that X value though. If I click and drag on the X letter to the left or the right very slowly, you can see that this object moves to the left and the right. As the values go below zero to negatives, it goes to the left, and as they go above zero into these positive numbers, they go to the right. And it looks like with my default camera setup, I can make it, well, in free aspect mode, I can make it to about what was that, 11 before it disappears off the screen. And you can do the same with the Y values. You can see I can move these things up and down just by adjusting these position values. Doing it in the inspector by dragging these though isn't very easy. One of the better ways to do that is to go to the scene view. If I go to the scene view and make sure that we're in our 2D mode again, and I hit the W key, that'll put me into move mode. Notice that the move mode icon selected. Now I can just click and drag on this box right here, the blue box to move it, up, down, left, and right, anywhere I want inside of this white box. And this white box is showing me what my game view is going to see. It's gonna show me what the camera's view frustum is, which is essentially what our player is going to see in the game view over here. If I click to the game view, you'll see that it's over in that same position. And if I move it over here to the top right up here, click the game view, it's in that same position. Now, one thing I can do and I often do to make things a little bit easier for me when I'm developing is move the game view side by side with the scene view. But notice that that camera there has just totally changed. Now everything doesn't fit and if I have my object in that same position, it's no longer on the screen. I have to move it way over here. The reason for this is pretty, well, I would say it's somewhat simple, but somewhat confusing. The aspect ratio, which is how wide the game is versus how tall it is, right now is in a free aspect mode, which means that it can be any width by any height, and it'll just work. But typically when we're building games, we build them in one of two aspect ratios, either a 16 by nine, where they're widescreen, kind of like you would see in a typical PC setup or on a phone, or nine by 16, where they, they're the taller portrait mode. And both of those options are available right here. Just by selecting 1920 by 1080, I'll get the widescreen 16 by nine view. Now I've got an object that I can move around and keep it inside my game view, no matter what I do with my game view, because that size isn't going to adjust, it's just gonna scale everything up properly. Now I'm gonna go back to the default layout by choosing window, and then layouts, and default. Now that we know how to move things around, let's see what else we can do. First, when I'm in the scene view, if I use my mouse wheel, I can zoom in and out on different areas to see whatever I wanna see or get closer to whatever I want. It'll zoom in wherever the cursor is, so if I put the cursor over the thing I wanna zoom in on and just twist the mouse wheel, it'll usually get me there. I can also use the middle mouse button to pan around and see the areas without clicking on objects. The left mouse button, of course, selects and allows me to drag things, and the right mouse button will select and highlight things. Now, I wanna change my mode, and there are a couple Couple different modes here. We have a rotate option, which is gonna do absolutely nothing on a circle. I won't notice it, so after I rotate it and my Z value has changed to a 72, I'll hit Control Z, which is the universal undo button in Windows. It undoes everything in Unity, just like you would expect, so just remember you can Control Z if you make a mistake. Now I wanna try out the scale tool. If I go to the scale tool, I can actually scale this circle up and make it quite a bit bigger. If I go to my game view, you see that this thing is now four four times larger, it's actually 4.2173 times larger, and I can adjust that right here. I can even do it on an individual axis so that it's four times taller and the same width, or I can set it back down to one and one and one. Down here on the sprite renderer, I've also got a couple of options. I can adjust the color, change it to a nice bright red or whatever I want. I could flip it around, but again, since it's a circle, it doesn't do anything. And I can go into the circle sprite editor, but this is not something that we need to deal with or do and it's not an editable sprite even. The circle is kind of a default one. This is for editing sprites that are kind of multi-edited sprites or more complex things. So I wanna make sure that you know that's there, but don't think that you need to go use that just yet. 
And by the way, that's one of those things that if you created a 3D project, won't be available. To fix that, you'll have to go into Window, and then go to Package Manager, and then find the 2D Sprite Editor right here and install that package. Now the circle and blue sky are fun and all, but this is supposed to be a game about birds that are really mad, so let's start adding in some bird art. To do that, we're going to import a Unity package, and a Unity package, for anyone who's worried, is really just a zip with a little bit of metadata, and this one just contains some PNG files. You can download the bird art package in the description or at game.courses slash birds. Okay. You can download the game... Ah. You can download the bird art package in the description or at game.courses slash birds. When you do, you'll just double click on it or drag it into the project view and be presented with a view that looks just like this with all of the different PNG files that are included. You can click through and see that we've got a couple animations for a green and a red bird. We've got a background and a ground piece, and then we've got a monster that we can crush and a couple of crates. We also have an outlined circle. Once you hit import, you'll see that these appear now in our assets folder. The assets folder now has an art folder and the art folder has a couple subfolders underneath it. We've got birds. Now you can see them in this bigger view and remember I've got this slider here that makes them bigger or turns them into little tiny views so that I can see the list and see all of the names. So we've got a beak red closed, a beak red closed one, a beak red open one, and a beak red open two. I think I might have said one there when that was a two. And you can see that I've got the same for these greens and the reds. Down below, I've got in my environment a ground and a background. And then in monsters, I've got the two sprites for my monster. And in props, the crate. And in UI, I've got this one circle. Now let's play around with this a little bit. Let's take our outlined circle here and we're going to drag it onto this sprite field. To do that, I'm going to click and hold my mouse down and then drag and release. If I do that, it should appear just like this, and I should see this black circle outline around my red dot. If I zoom in and out with my mouse wheel, I see that it does get a little bit pixelated, and I can adjust the scale right here. Now, if you missed that, you went and you clicked right here on Outline Circle, and this popped up, don't worry. All you need to do is go back to the circle, click, and hold and drag and drop it right onto here. You can also hit this little circle button here, which I, I've got a lot of circles here, but this little circle indicator is a search option that allows us to go search for any sprite in our project. So here you can see, instead of the circle, I could perhaps just choose this beak red closed one. Let's go choose that and look at that. We've now got a nice bird showing up in our view, but the bird is tinted kind of red. If you look at him, he looks a little bit weird. That's because our color on our sprite is overriding or adding to our existing sprite. To fix that, we can change this back to a white by clicking on the color and then dragging all the way up here, making sure that this is at 255, 255, 255. Now I've got the bird showing up exactly how I expected him to look. Now that our bird is looking good, let's delete him. And we're gonna do this so that we can create an animated bird. But first, let's see the process of deleting something in Unity. In my scene hierarchy here, I can select the object. Remember that the circle is the bird. And right now the circle has a pretty terrible name because it's called circle, but it's no longer a circle, just kind of a round bird. If I go to the scene view, I can see that my bird is selected here. And if I go again back over to the hierarchy, when I click on it, it actually turns blue to show me everything that's selected. I can delete it by just hitting the delete key. You can also right click and hit delete, but I never do that. I always just use the keyboard shortcut. Now I want a bird that's animated. I want a bird that can flap its wings. Let's go take a look at our bird sprites again by clicking on them. Remember they're in your assets, art, and birds folder. We've got a bird red open, which is right here, red open one. And then I've got a bird red open two. Look at that, where the wing is up. That's kind of like a little flapping animation. If I went back and forth between the two, it looks like he's flapping his wing. You can see I can make this view bigger and it doesn't really show too much bigger because it's a small sprite. I can also right click and disconnect it. So if it pops off or is gone somewhere, you know, just make sure that you click for it or right click to get it to pop up. Now we've got another bird option down here. There's also a meek green bird. So if you wanted to use the green bird, you could do that as well. In fact, I think this time for the first time ever, I'm going to use the green bird and I'm not going to use the closed one because I might want to use those later for when my bird is flying. Now to do that, when I mean flying, I mean like flying into a brick, maybe he's in a, or a crate and close his eyes or something. All right. Or she it looks, she looks pretty like a girl. All right, let's go select both of these sprites and then we'll drag them into the scene view. To do that, I'm going to click on open one 
and then I'll hold shift and click on open two. That'll select everything in a row. See if I clicked on open one up here or closed one up here and shift all the way down here, it'll select everything. I can also just click left click and then hold control to additional click. It's a lot like general windows clicking and selecting. Now that I've got both of those selected, I can drag them into my scene hierarchy and watch what happens. I'm not gonna get two objects. Instead, I'm gonna get a pop-up that's gonna ask me to name a .anim file. Well, this is the animation file for my green bird with open eyes. So I'm gonna call this green bird open eyes and then just hit the save button and let it save it right here in my art birds folder. That's going to do two things. First, it's gonna create a game object right here, this bird, if I go to my game view, you can see it. But it's also going to add an animator component to it and create an animation. If I press the play button now, the first time we've pressed it, let's see what happens. We should expect to see a bird flapping its wings very quickly. Now, if I click off the bird, I can kind of see it, but it's still a little bit obstructed. I could also view it a little bit better by hiding the gizmos with this view in the scene view but I don't like to turn that off because then sometimes I forget that it's there. So I'll turn it back on and instead stop playing and I'm just gonna take my bird and move it a little bit to the left by putting in a negative three here and then I'll press play and go check it out in the scene view one more time. Get a nice close up view of my bird flapping its wings. So there we go, I can see my bird flapping its wings but it's flapping a little bit too fast and I want to adjust that. So how do we modify this animation? Let's go take a look at our meek green open one object object here, which is actually our bird or our player. We'll rename it soon. And let's take a look at the animator underneath it. The animator is always going to have a controller on it. And the controller controls animation state switching. We don't need to dive into that because our character is just going to have one animation state. So we just need to figure out how to get to that animation and modify it. We can double click on the controller to see what it's doing here. It's running this bird eyes open animation over and over really, 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 really fast. So what if we want to just slow it down? Well, we can click on this animation. And then over here on the right, we get some data in the inspector for this specific animation, and we can adjust the speed right here. Now, I want to adjust this speed, but I want to make sure that you can see it in the game view adjusting. So I'm going to click over to the game view without clicking on anything else, and then change the speed down to like a 0.1. You can see that, whoa, that's a little bit slow, right? So let's go like a 0.5. There we go, I think that's closer to what I wanted, about half the speed that it was running at before. So now I've modified that animation speed just by changing this speed variable. Now if you're curious where the animation is, you can actually click on it and then double click on the motion right here to view the animation. You have to go select the object in the scene hierarchy though for it to show in the animation window. Typically the animation window is docked down at the bottom like this and when you're not playing, you go into scene view, you can actually select your object and then scrub through the different animation frames. Since we only have two, there's just these two right here to scrub through, but we can add multiple and then scrub through them all. We're not gonna go into deep into animation in this video because it's not a super important part of this. You can add more and more animation and get really complex with it, but understanding where all of these parts are is important as you're doing game development. So far we've got an animating bird, but not really a game. And it's time to start adding in physics to our game so that it'll feel more interactive. And then finally some player input. Let's first though save our level. And to save our level, we choose file and save or control S. Now, where did our level save to? Well, that's actually in this scenes folder here. And you can see that this level is named sample scene. And that's the same as what we see up here in our hierarchy. That's because when we load up Unity by default with a new project, it puts us into a sample scene. And while it's great to have a sample scene, we should probably make our own level so that it doesn't get overridden later by somebody who thinks it's it's really just a sample scene like us in the future or if we do some update to Unity or something else. So we'll do that by right clicking and choosing save scene as or going to file and save scene as and then go to scenes and then I'm going to name this level one. I can have a space in it or no space, it doesn't really matter. But now you'll see that I have two scenes in my scenes folder. The other thing I wanna do is go to my sample scene and delete it. And the main reason for that is I don't want to accidentally work in my sample scene because I started setting it up and then think I'm working in my level one scene and have my work just be kind of wasted and thrown away. And make sure that I only have the scenes around that I'm actually intending to work on, especially when you're starting out and getting used to this stuff. So we've got our level one scene and we wanna make our bird fall down. To make 
make our bird fall down, we're going to integrate the Unity physics system. It's actually quite a bit easier than it sounds. We'll select our Meek Green Open 1, which is our player bird. And first, we're going to rename it. We're going to select up here in the inspector, the top right, and just name it B-I-R-D. It's a bird. That's our player's bird, and we're going to give it a name already. You can also double-click slowly over here on the left-hand side in the hierarchy and rename it there, but I've already got the right name, so I'm just going to type in the same thing. Now that I've got my bird selected, I've got the sprite renderer. Remember the one where we could tint things? I don't want to tint it though. I'm going to collapse that sprite renderer. I've also got the animator that allows me to control that animation speed. I don't want to use that either right now. I want to expand out or collapse those out and then choose the add component button. In the add component option or the add component menu, I get a whole bunch of options. There's 2D animation, audio effects. Events, layouts, lights, mesh, miscellaneous, physics 2D, physics, playables, rendering, scripts, tile map UI, toolkit UI, video, visual scripting, and the option to create my own new script. What we want is physics, but specifically physics 2D because we're building a 2D game. We'll click on that and we've got a whole bunch of other options, which can definitely be confusing. We've got effectors like the area effector. Box Collider, Buoyancy Effector, Capsule Collider, so we've got Effectors and Colliders. We've got a Constant Force option, we've got some Joints, and then we've got Rigid Bodies, and I think that's about it. Really quickly, we'll talk about what these are. Effectors modify the way that things move inside of trigger areas. This is for things like bouncing water, buoyancy, or like floating wind areas. Not something that we need to dive into yet. Colliders are used for collision. We're going to talk about them soon. Joints are used for physics, things like imagine you've got well, anything with a joint, like a wire or a chain or something like that. And then the rigid body 2D is used to control the core of physics. So that's what we're going to add, a rigid body 2D. In 3D games, you'll add a rigid body. In 2D games, you just add a rigid body 2D. Now, with that rigid body 2D, I'm going to save my scene and watch that little star disappear when I save with Control S. I'll press play, and let's see what happens with our bird. Look at that, the bird just falls right down to the ground. Let's stop playing and let's change this gravity scale value to a zero. If you don't see that, make sure that you've selected the bird. You've got your inspector here and you've collapsed these others and you just see the rigid body. Sometimes you have so many things on here that the rigid body or whatever might just be off screen too. So make sure you collapse everything above, set that gravity scale to zero and press play. And guess what's gonna happen? Guess in the comments if you want. It just stays still. But while I'm playing, if I change that value to a one, look at that, now my bird falls. Now, by default in Angry Birds, or the game that we're gonna build, our bird's not gonna be falling. It's not gonna fall until we've launched it off into the air. So leaving the gravity scale at zero actually is a good start for our game. Now that our bird's looking good and animating, let's update our environment to look good too. If I go to my game view, you can see that my background is still that bright blue that I set on the camera earlier. I said we could change this later, but we're just gonna swap in a background so that we don't really need to worry about that. To do that, we're gonna go to our art folder and then the environment subfolder and look at the summer background. If I just click and drag this out into my scene, you'll see that, well, first my bird disappeared and second, I've got this interesting sized background here. It's a little bit scaled up though. If I go to my scene view and zoom out with my mouse wheel, you'll see that it's actually bigger than my entire camera view. That's okay, I don't mind it being bigger, but I do wanna probably move it up just a little bit so that the bottom is nearer to the, um, the edge. So I think I'm gonna put the Y position, I think I'll actually put it at one so that it's up just a little bit higher. That's again with the summer background selected, setting the Y value here to one. I can drag it up and down to move it. I can also scale it, by the way. If I go into my scene view and I just use the scale tool, I can shrink it down, but I don't really wanna do that. I wanna keep this set to a one, one, and one here so that it kind of fills in the entire area. In fact, we're gonna to need to fill in more area because eventually we're gonna to need to tile this across if our bird goes flying from one side all the way over and past the edge here. Now, where'd our bird go though? Because our bird is still in the scene, but he's not visible. What's actually happening here, if we look at our sprite renderer, is that we have sorting layers for our different sprites. If I go to my scene view, you can see that my bird is still there, kind of somewhat visible. You can see the outline of him when I select him. But with this summer background here, having the same default sorting layer and the same order and layer, 
makes this summer background render right on top of my bird, so I can't see it. If I turn off the sprite renderer or the game object, I could see it, but the actual better solution is to either add a new sorting layer beyond the default or adjust the sorting layer. The way that objects are rendered is in order from zero or from the lowest value to the highest value. I can actually set negative values here like a negative one and notice that my background pushed back behind and the bird suddenly appeared. If I set this back to a zero, then it will reappear or the background will reappear and the or over the top of the bird and the bird will disappear. Now this is one way to adjust it using the order and layer, but there's also this sorting layer option which is important to understand and to use properly. Let's click on it and hit the add sorting layer option. There's default and add sorting layer by by default, those are your two options. So when we do this, we get the tags and layers inspector. This is actually a custom inspector over a secret kind of somewhat hidden object in there, but it gives us the ability to change tags, sorting layers, and layers. I'm gonna collapse layers. I just expanded it to show you that it was all there, what it looked like, but we want a new sorting layer, which is what we use for rendering. So I hit the plus button and I'm gonna give this a name. I'm gonna call it background. And then I'm going to assign my background to it. So I'll go select my summer background and then choose the sorting layer drop down again. And now background is there. That didn't fix anything though. And the reason for that, if I go to my add sorting layer menu again, is that background is rendering after the default layer. I want it to render before by, so all I have to do is drag it up here so that it becomes layer zero or becomes before layer one. And now it will render behind. Now I've got my background rendering in the back and my bird still on the default layer rendering in the front. I don't have to change the order and layer on them and they both show up. Now let's add the ground object. To do that, we're gonna to go to the environment folder and we're gonna take the summer ground and we're gonna drag that out here as well. This doesn't look right at all though, does it? It looks like a giant, huge block just kind of floating in the middle. Not exactly like our other objects that just looked good at zero, zero, zero for their position. So let's move this thing first. To do that, we're gonna hit W or choose the move option here, the move tool. And then we'll click and drag with the blue button or the blue box here. I'm gonna drag it down right to about here. And notice that my values are snapping. My values are going by quarters. That's because I'm holding down the left control button. If you don't hold that down, it'll move around kind of freely and you won't get these nice snaps where it kind of goes to the exact points without all the decimals. And I like to have the decimals there or with not have the decimals there and have it be snapped in a little bit better. So I hold down that control button. I'm gonna put it down to right about here. So it looks like this is about a negative five so that the edge of it is right along with the line. Actually, I think I'm gonna move it up even more. I'm going to a negative four so that the bottom of it is right along the line of my camera. Now this ground piece, if I go to the game view, does not fill in the entire ground. It needs to go all the way across to the edge. To make that happen, we need to change something on our sprite renderer. So far, we've looked at the sprite option and changed out the sprite, making a circle into a bird. And we've looked at the color option to add a tint. We could always add a tint here, but it definitely doesn't help. So let's hit escape and undo that. What we wanna do instead is change this draw mode here from simple to tiled. Tiled allows us to have tiles of sprites so that it'll go all the way across and just repeat. Now to make it repeat across, we'll just adjust this tile width from, let's go from a two to a 20. I think that's a good width. If I go to my scene view, I can see that it expands just past the edges here. I could even go up to maybe a 40 though and have it go on even further beyond. Now you might be thinking, hey, can't we do this to the background as well? Well, of course we can. We can go to the background and change this from simple to tiled, and then we can change this width just by multiplying the value. Right now it says 25.64. If I wanna make this three times larger, I can just go right to the end and add a star, which is what we use for multiplication in game development and programming, and then put a three, and look at that, it's now tiled three times wide. But let's go back to that summer ground and take a look at the height. Right now the height defaulted to two, and if I set it to a one, we're gonna get this weird look. If I zoom in, you see that the ground is kind of cut off, and 
things aren't looking right. There's a reason for that, and it might be a little bit confusing for anybody who's new to game development or just new to 2D development. If we go look at our summer ground object again, let's take a look at the settings here. We've got our sprite mode set to single, which is normal. If we just have a single object in our sprite, we set it to single. A sprite mode of multiple is for when we have a sheet of multiple sprites all on one image. We then have our pixels per unit set to 100. If we look down here at our sprite though, we can see some details about it, like the preview image and the size of it. This one is 200 by 200 pixels. So if I adjust this pixels per unit to match, and I set this to, whoops, I just typed in 100, but if I set it to 200 so that it matches and hit apply, look at that, our tile of two times, or our tile value of two, is now actually showing what you might expect for a tile value of two, where it's the same thing doubled up instead of just one. Again, it was because our pixels per unit was not set correctly on the ground. And that's an important thing for you to take a look at on all of your sprites. On our summer background, it didn't really matter too much. That's why we did that multiply by three and we got this weird 76 number. And on our summer ground, it did make a big difference because now we can set our height to one and we can see what our ground looks like. If I go back to my game view though, now you'll see that my ground is slightly above where I wanted it to be. So I need to move this down just a little bit more and I could do that by dragging it down here. I could go back over to the scene view or I could just type in negative 4.5 because I've got a good idea of that's about what I want. So now that I've got a ground, let's save, press play and watch our bird fall right onto that ground. Of course, to do that, we've got to go to our bird and set his gravity scale to one. But look at that, he just disappeared. Where'd our bird actually go? If I double click on it, you'll see, oh, I can't even keep up with it. It's falling, and if I look at that Y position, the Y value is just falling and falling and falling forever. Now, if you know why, drop a comment below. And if you don't, well, you're about to learn something very important about Unity physics. Let's stop playing and go to the scene view. If I go to my scene view and look at my bird, you'll see that I've got this bird object here, and when I press play and pause, I'm gonna hit the pause button and press play, we can actually step ahead and watch our bird fall. If I click this button here, I can step forward one frame at a time. It's, oh, I've gotta set my gravity scale back to one. I can step forward one frame at a time and watch my bird fall, 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 and drop all the way down. And he hits the ground, but why doesn't he stop? Well, let's think about this for a second. Our background object is a sprite. Our ground object is a sprite. We don't want our bird to land on the background. We only want him to land on the actual ground. So there must be something that needs to be different about the ground. And that something that needs to be different is that it needs to have a collider. A collider is one of those things that was in that 2D physics section that we looked at that's required for doing collisions. For objects to land or touch each other, they need to have some info about how they should collide with each other. You obviously don't want everything to collide and some things you want to collide in different ways. Some things you just want to do like an explosion when you walk through or trigger and open up a door. Other things you want to explode when they get touched or just stop movement completely. Colliders aren't that complicated to add though. The first thing that we'll need to do is go to our summer ground object and choose add component. Go back to that physics 2D section and we're going to choose a box collider 2D because it's a rectangle. A box collider is the perfect shape for it. So we choose box collider 2D and you may have noticed these little green lines that appeared here. Those green lines are the lines for the collider. If I zoom in or just uncheck the sprite renderer, you can see I've got this box here. That box represents what will be collided with. And I mentioned that you can have something that is slightly different visualization, or maybe I didn't, but you can always have a visualization that totally doesn't match with your character or your sprites. You've probably seen it when you play a first person shooter game and you do a headshot and it looks like it perfectly hit him right in the air, but it went past. It's because the collider doesn't exactly match up to the sprite. So we need to fix that. To fix that, I'm gonna re-enable my sprite renderer so I can see how far my sprite's going. And then we're gonna go to the box collider and we're gonna choose the auto tiling option. That'll automatically make it stretch out to fit the tiling size of the sprite renderer. Now, if I press play, do we expect our bird to hit the ground? Well, let's see. We go in, we press play, we change our bird's gravity scale to one and he still falls through. The reason for that, well, you may have already guessed, is that our bird also needs a collider. For 
game objects to collide, both things need to have a collider, otherwise it wouldn't make sense because how would it know what to collide with? We can't collide with every sprite renderer, just like I said, we can't with the background, we couldn't do it with our bird. So we'll add a collider to our bird and we have a couple options here. Let's zoom in on our bird. Our bird is kind of circular, so we could go add component, physics 2D, and choose a circle collider 2D. That would be pretty close. It would look like this, but I don't want that one. I want something that's more accurate. So I'm gonna right click and remove that component. Instead, we're gonna hit add component, go to physics 2D, and we're gonna look for the polygon collider. It's a little bit confusing of a name, but what it really is, is it's one that matches to the sprite renderer. It'll find the sprite renderer and then match the collider to it. If I zoom in, I've got my word a little bit mixed up there, you can see the little green lines around our sprite. Those show us our collider. Now, finally, if I press play one more time and we go adjust that scale, the gravity scale on our bird's rigid body, back up to a one, we'll see our bird falls and plop lands on the ground. All right, let's pause from the core game and take a look at something interesting and fun on this collider. You notice that our collider has a material section and one of the cool things that we can do in Unity out of the box is create a physics material. If I right click, I'm gonna do this in my environment folder because I'm gonna delete this. I can right click and choose create and choose 2D and choose physics material 2D. I can name this bouncy, B-O-U-N-C-Y. The name doesn't actually matter, but I like to have good names and then change the bounciness value from a zero to a one. These values range from zero to one, it's 0% to 100%, one is 100%, and you use decimals to go up from there, or up from zero to one. And we're gonna assign this now to our summer ground. So I select my summer ground and I drag the bouncy material onto the material section right here. Press play, and let's go turn that gravity scale up on our bird and see what it does now probably exactly what you would expect, which is bounce. Look at that, pretty cool. Just wanted to show you another neat thing that you can do with Unity Physics, and you might wanna start adding this back in as we build up our game even further. All right, now let's stop playing and get to the fun stuff. We're gonna write some code. To write code, we're gonna need two things. One is a code editor, and two is a folder to put our code in. We'll start by creating a folder for our code. I'm gonna go to the Assets folder, right click, choose create and create a new folder, and I'm gonna name this scripts. It's a very common default name for Unity projects, so that's what we're gonna use. Now technically you can put your code in any folder, I could put it in that art folder just like I did that bouncy material, but usually you wanna keep things organized, so creating a scripts folder helps a lot. Now we're gonna open up that scripts folder by hitting enter, right click, and we're gonna create a new script by choosing create, and C Sharp script. We're gonna name this bird, B-I-R-D, with a capital B. This is going to be the script that controls our bird or our player in this game. I'll hit enter and the script will be created. Once you've created the script, it should look like this. You'll see the bird down here with the inspector showing what's inside of that file. The file is just gonna be text and we're gonna modify it with our code editor. To do that, we double click on the script and it'll open up either Visual Studio, Visual Studio Code, or JetBrains Writer, or whatever code editor you're using. Whichever one you installed by default is probably the one that you're going with. And that's what I would recommend you stay with. Don't worry too much about code editors or changing them until you get quite a bit more advanced. So here we've got our bird script. I can tell that it's my bird script because it says here on line five, bird. It says public class bird and then has this colon mono behavior which means that it's a unity script that's going to be added to a game object or that it'll only really do something once it's added to a game object. It also means that we get these couple magic methods. If you've done any programming before you might wonder what these are. These start and update methods. These are both methods that get called automatically by Unity whenever our bird is created or whenever our game is started. Well, this one is whenever our game is started or whenever our bird is created. And this one in the update method is called every single frame of our game on every single bird. We'll talk a bit more about what that means, but first let's add a little bit of code here to get some better understanding and a little bit better footing of what's happening here. So inside of this update method on line 16, we're going to write out a simple log. We'll just write debug, capital D, D-E-B-U-G, dot log, and we're gonna put in an open parentheses with the shift in nine, and then the quotation marks, and we're just gonna put the word updated. 
And then it's going to have a closing quotation marks that were automatically added by my code editor. Yours will probably do that too. A closing parentheses, again, automatically added. Yours will probably do that. If not, you'll have to type it. And then at the end, we need a semicolon. I'm going to save now. Notice that the star will disappear as soon as I hit control S. And then we're going to go back into Unity and we're going to add this script to our bird. So I'll minimize that window, our code editor window. And then we're going to go select our bird. And then we're going to click on this bird script and drag it onto the inspector right here. We could also alternatively hit add component and search for the word bird. You can see I've done it right there, B-I-R-D, and find it. Now if I do that and I add two birds on here, that's a problem. I don't want two bird scripts on there. I only want one. So I'll right click and remove the duplicate of the second one. Now I'm gonna save my scene, watch that star disappear, just like in our code editor, and press play. Now let's see what happens in our game, what amazing change we've made. Well, our bird's sitting there flapping and nothing seems to change, but we did do that debug log, so where is that going? Well, you might remember earlier I mentioned we have a console, and that's where it went, but there's nothing here. The reason for that is that we have three little buttons here that allow us to show informational things, warnings, and errors. Luckily, we have no warnings and we have no errors. All we have is informational logs that we've updated. Mine are all in one row. If I uncheck the collapsed option, I'll get a single row for each time we're updated, which right now is once per frame, which is a whole lot of times. If I hit collapse again, you can see just how fast it's actually running. That's how many times this update method has been called and how many times we've written out the word updated to the log. Quite a few, probably not that useful, but hopefully you're getting the idea that update is called every single frame while the game is playing. If I pause, Update's no longer called. If I stop, pause, or go back into play mode, update's getting called again. All right, let's stop playing and go take a look at our code. Let's do it this time by double clicking on the log entry. That'll actually take us right to the point where we wrote that log, and I'll put our cursor right there. Now, since this log entry isn't that useful, other than teaching us how update works, let's delete it. We'll select it by just clicking and dragging over it and hitting delete, or you could hit shift delete to delete the whole line, but that'll get rid of your extra spacing and we wanna put something in the update, so I have to go up and then hit enter to re-add the line if you do that. Now that we've got our blank line 16, let's write some code that's conditional. What I wanna do in here is check to see if our player ever presses the, oh, let's say Q key on our keyboard. And to do that, we're gonna add an if statement. We use if, lowercase on both of those, and then we put in a parentheses, which is that shift nine. And here what we wanna check is the input system. We're going to use the, what's called old Unity input system, but it's the default one that's easy to use without having to do a lot of setup or write a bunch of code, and it'll definitely handle our scenario here. So we'll say if input with a capital I, you can see it's trying to autocomplete, and here we're gonna say get, key down, which is gonna to check to see if any key was pressed this frame or the specific key that we request. And we request it by giving it more parameters and we give parameters by having an open parentheses with that shift nine. Now this is gonna take a key code. So we'll use key code and you would be able to see this but the autocomplete popped just off the screen. It says key code key. So we'll use key code dot, and here we've got a nice long dropdown of every key on a standard keyboard. I'm just gonna go with Q because it's just here at the top left of my key keyboard, and I assume you've got a Q key as well. So if the Q key is pressed, then we're going to debug.log, and we're gonna put in the quotation marks, Q pressed. Once we've got that figured out, we'll move on to making it do something a little bit more powerful. Let's go try this out and then we'll talk about how it works a little bit more. So I'm gonna go back into Unity and then we'll press play once it recompiles. And we should no longer see that spam in our log where it said updated. But if I click over into the game view and it's important that I click into the game view and give it context and press the Q button, you see that Q gets pressed or Q pressed gets logged every single time I press Q. If I click outside of there though and hit Q, it doesn't work. I have to be clicked inside of the game view. That's cool. That means that we've now got reactionary code that's handling or re reacting to our input. It's not doing anything exciting, just writing out a log entry, but we now know how to make 
something react to input. Let's go back in there and make it do something a little bit more powerful. Let's in fact make it adjust our rigid body. Let's make it set that rigid body gravity scale to one so that our bird will fall down. We'll open up our bird script again and this time I'm gonna do it by double clicking on the bird script part right here. See the word script? Just double click on bird and it'll pop up our script again. Now I'm gonna replace line 17 instead of just logging out Q pressed, we're going to get the rigid body component and tell it to set its gravity scale to one. To do that, we're gonna use a special method built into mono behaviors as part of Unity, and that's the get component method. We type get component, and then here we're gonna use the less than and greater than keys, which are you know, on my keyboard next to M, it's the comma and period with a shift, maybe different on yours, but that's my standard one here. I'm gonna get component and we do less than, and we're gonna put in rigid body, 2D, very important that we get the 2D part. If we don't get the 2D part, we're not gonna find the component because it's gonna look for a 3D rigid body. Now I gotta go over to the right of that greater than arrow and add in two parentheses, which is a little bit confusing, but that's essentially telling it to get a component of type rigid body, and then the two parentheses is saying, hey, go execute that and actually get it. Next, we need to do a dot, which is going to allow us to modify properties of that rigid body, or fields or properties, technically, or call methods. But what we really want to modify was, do you remember? That's right, the gravity scale. So we'll set the gravity scale equal to, and to do an equal, we just use a single equal sign, and then a one, because we're just gonna set it to one. We'll put a semicolon there, because at the end of every statement that's an action, a thing that we want to do, we have to add a semicolon. At the end of line 16, though, notice that we don't have a semicolon. The reason for that is that it's not an action, it's a conditional statement, it's one that's checking it. So we don't add it at the end of those statements, we do add it at the end of actions. And setting gravity scale sounds like an action to me. So let's save again, get control S and make sure that star is gone. And if you make changes to your game and you find that the changes aren't working a lot of the time, it's because you've forgotten to save your files. So make sure that you go back in and press save. Now that we are back in, I should be able to press play. And then when I hit Q, well, you can probably guess what's gonna happen. Feel free to drop it in the comments. See if you guessed right, let's go press it. Look at that, the bird fell and uh, started to bounce because apparently I did not remove my bounciness. Now that we've figured out how to use components and scripting a little bit, let's go back into our bird script and allow our player to drag the bird around when they use the mouse or allow them to click and drag to move the bird around. We'll open up the bird script by double clicking on it and we're gonna remove this start method for now. So I'm gonna select line seven, uh, click left click and drag all the way down to the end of line 11 and hit the delete key. I wanna just remove that out and shrink this so that we're not taking up so much space and it's a little bit easier to see what we're doing. Now I'm gonna press the tab key just to line up my cursor perfectly and I'm gonna add an on mouse drag. You can see that it's automatically completing and I can hit enter and have it auto complete, but let me just type it out to show you what it looks like if you have to type it manually if your code editor doesn't work. We need first void, V-O-I-D, which is the return type, it means don't return anything, which is standard for these built-in magic Unity methods. We'll put void on with capital O-N, then mouse with a capital M, and drag with a capital D. Next, I need my open and close parentheses. Oh, look at that, I, I started it and it automatically completed and added in my curly braces as well. So the on mouse drag method will be everything that's inside of these parentheses. It did add a private keyword here as well. I don't actually need that, it's redundant. That's the default access modifier. It's something that we'll talk about later, but we don't need to worry about right now. And we can actually delete it just by double clicking on it and hitting delete. Or if I'm at the beginning of the word, I can hold control and hit delete to just delete one word. Now in my on mouse drag, I wanna move my game object or my bird to the position where my mouse is. To do that, we'll need two things. First, we'll need the input mouse position, and then we're gonna to need to pass that into our camera to tell it to give us a world position based on that screen position. This is a somewhat complicated conversion, but it's automatically done for us with a couple lines of code. The more complex part is that we're going to be storing this off into a variable. If you've never used a variable before, well, get ready, because it's gonna be a lot of fun. We're gonna create our first variable named position, or let's call it destination, by typing var destination equals, and here we're gonna type in something somewhat long, so just follow along and we'll explain it as we go. Camera 
dot main. This is going to get our main camera from our game, from our current scene. I'll show you how to tell what the main camera is in a moment. By the way, for anybody who tried Unity a long time ago, camera.main used to be really slow. It's now cached and fast. There's no reason not to use it here. So we'll use camera.main dot screen point to world point, or so it's actually screen to world point. And you can see the capitalization, there's a capital S, T, and W, and a P, capitalizing every single word along the way, which is cons commonly known as Pascal case. Now we need to put a parenthesis and pass in a parameter, and that parameter is going to be the world, or the screen space position, which is what we get from the input dot get mouse position, or not get mouse position, sorry, mouse position method. If I add a semicolon to the end after that parentheses, I now have a position which is stored as a vector three. You can see right there on the screen that it says vector three destination. And now this var keyword, I wanted to point this out right from the beginning because you're gonna see this a lot. Var is a shortcut for put whatever, create whatever type of variable you need to assign this data and just assume that we know that this is whatever type is being assigned to it. So it's a less explicit or more implicit way of assign creating variables and then giving them some assigned value. If I put vector three here, V-E-C-T-O-R three, it's going to be exactly the same. It's gonna have no functional difference. It's just a little bit more explicit. So you could see things written either way. It may not be a vector three. It could be a quaternion or a game object or a bird or anything else assigned as var instead of the type. Var again just means that it's a generic thing that could be, it's whatever the thing is assigned to it. It does, it's not something that can change dynamically or anything. There's actually a keyword for that. We'd never use it, it's dynamic. But it allows you to assign things or declare them based on what's assigned, just to keep things a little bit shorter and simpler. And again, it gets confusing, so I wanted to make sure that we call that out. Now that we've got the destination, all we need to do to move our character is access the transform and set its position. Luckily, that's something that's so commonly done that the transform is just built in. If I type in transform, I can access it immediately. And if I type in dot position, I can just set it with the equals and set it to our destination. The transform position is a vector three, which again just means it has an X, a Y, and a Z component for our 3D positions. We're only using two of those. We're not using the Z, but it, we get back a 3D position from the camera screen point to world point method. Now let's go back into Unity and see what happens if we use this. If I click and drag, you see that, well, I've got my bird selected and the Z and, or the X and Y positions are moving around, but that Z doesn't look right. It went to negative 10 and my bird totally disappeared. I release and my bird doesn't reappear. So what's going on? Why is that a problem? Well, what's actually happening, if we go to our scene view and go to 3D mode and then double click on our bird, is that our bird is now way back behind the background and that's not even what matters because that's controlled by the sprite renderer. The actual issue is that our camera is now at the exact same position as our bird. So our bird is being called because it's just too close to the camera. The camera has a close up distance that it'll render and right on top, it will not render. If I move to the camera back just a little bit, you see the bird would appear. Or if I moved the bird forward just a little bit, it would appear as well. But that's not what we want. What we want is to set that Z position of the bird to zero. So let's go back into the code and add another line so that we can fix that. We'll add a line right here after nine. So I go to the end of line nine and hit enter to add a new line. And we're gonna say destination, dot z is equal to zero. That'll put the bird right back on that zero line or that flat plane that we have for our game. And we should be able to see him again once we start dragging him around. So let's play. And then we'll click and drag. And look at that, our bird now moves around. I can release and just drop him wherever I want. It's getting close, right? We've got some really nice input, some actions that we can do. It's time to start launching this bird off. To make our bird launch, we're gonna to need to know two things. First, where our bird was when the player started clicking and dragging and where they were when they stopped so that when we release, it can go flying up in the direction away or opposite of where we drug the bird. So we're gonna to need to keep track of both of those things or at least keep track of that initial position and then calculate based on our current position some amount of force and physics stuff that will magically pass into the Unity physics system to make our bird go flying. So let's stop 
playing and begin by caching that initial position. We're going to go into our bird script. And do you remember how we had that start method that was here that's called at the beginning of the game? Well, that's the kind of method that we would use to keep track of our bird's position at start. So we're going to re-add it now. We're going to hit enter, enter. I'm going to go up right here to line seven. I'm just going to type start and just let it automatically complete it. I should get a private void start. If you don't, then just make sure that you type out that start with a capital S. Don't typo anything and get your parentheses. I'm going to get rid of that private keyword because again, it's redundant. We just don't need it. And more words just makes it a little bit more confusing when you're starting. So what we want to do now is save off our current position right at the beginning of the game into a variable. And if I did something like this, vector three, current, or let's call the starting position, position equals transform dot position. This would save our starting position into this starting position variable. And we would now have a starting position saved, but we would have one big, big problem. And that's at the end of this start method, this variable would go away. And that's because any method or any variable, sorry, that's declared inside of a method like start on mouse drag or update is automatically destroyed, removed and cleaned up when the method ends. So at the end of the start method, that position goes away. All right, think, oh, well, that's kind of useless. Like, why would I want that to happen? Well, the reason for it is simple. We've got things like this on mouse drag where we want a variable that's at like this destination, but we don't need to keep that around every frame. We don't need to keep that around for the life of the bird. We just need it for the end of this method or until the end of the method. At the end of that point, we don't need to have it. So we clean it up to save on performance, save on memory. It's, it's largely a performance thing and some stuff underneath the hood. But in general, just know that a variable that's declared inside of a method only exists inside of a method. There's a solution for that though. If we move this variable declaration, not the setting, not, not this part here, the equals tra transform.position, but just the declaration, if we move this out of a method, but still inside of our class, then it becomes a member variable or a class variable, a variable that's part of that class or object as long as the object is around until it gets destroyed or cleaned up by something. To do that, we'll take line nine, not all of it, just the vector three starting position part, and I'm gonna copy it, control C. I'm gonna go right up here to line six and paste it so that I've got a vector three starting position. I'm gonna add a semicolon and now it's almost good. The one problem that I have now though is that since we're declaring this variable on line seven, we can't re-declare it on variable 11. In fact, if I do a build, it shouldn't let me, but it is letting me build and do a, a new version of it where I've got two of that same variable name. I don't want that to happen. So I need to make sure that I delete that so that I'm always using this starting position. We can have two variables with the same name. It can get confusing. Make sure that you avoid that. Just don't re-declare variables inside of your method. So we've got our starting position now equal to transform.position. All right, now that we've got that, we just need to use it when we release the mouse and figure out how to launch our character off. Before we do that though, let's take a look in Unity and see if we can check out this new variable that we've created. I'm gonna press play and we've got our bird selected and you can see my bird script right down here. It doesn't show anything at all. All of these other components are showing things. The sprite renderer has a bunch of fields. The animator has a couple. The rigid body you saw had the gravity scale and other things, but the bird's not showing anything. And we do have that one variable on it. And the reason that variable is not showing is because it's private. And that was that default that I mentioned before. We can have public and private things. Private things do not show up in the inspector public things do. There's more to it, but that's the first thing that you need to know about them. We can, however, view private things by choosing this little drop down here and picking debug, which is just off the screen. This shows a whole complicated, confusing view of most things, but it also shows us our starting position right here on the bird, which is negative three, zero, and zero. And if you look here at our local position on that transform, negative three, zero, zero. Also though, notice that our transform editor is all weird looking. Our sprite renderer one is gonna look weird and all the rest of them will too. So if I click on this drop down and go back to normal, everything will look normal again. But now I know that my starting position is being saved off as negative three, zero, and zero because I saw that in debug mode. So let's try using it now with the on mouse up method. Here we are back in the bird script and we're gonna add the new method on mouse up. And this is another one of the built-in Unity methods. 
If you're ever wondering what all methods there are to, or these messages that are available, just make sure you search for Unity messages or Unity methods or mono behavior methods, and you'll find this nice little documentation that shows every single one of the callbacks with a bunch of info on how to use them. If we look for the on mouse up, you see that it says it's called whenever the user releases the mouse button, but that it's called even if the mouse is not over the same collider the mouse was pressed down on. So if I press down on a button on something and then I release it up even off of something else, it'll still call. In our situation though, we're always gonna be moving our bird around, so it's always gonna be the thing that we happen to release up from as well. Let's go back into the code and add the on mouse up method. Let a void on mouse up there we go, up, up, just up. And then we'll add in our parentheses. And in the on mouse up method, we need to calculate out the direction between our current position and the starting position. Imagine we drag our bird down to the left. That's our current position. We need to know that position separated from our start position. To do that, we're gonna use some simple vector math. All we need is a new variable called, let's say vector three, We'll call this direction and magnitude because it's not going to be M-A-G-N-I-T-U-D-E. It's not gonna be just the direction, but it's the direction plus how far away we have pulled our, our bird. To calculate that, we'll use our starting position minus our transform dot position or our current position. Next, we wanna add some force in the direction and magnitude that we, we wanna launch. So that's our direction and magnitude there. To add a force, we need to access our rigid body component. So we'll say get component, just like we did before. And we're gonna use that less than sign and we need to put in our rigid body 2D. There we go. I love to use the autocomplete and just let it type for me as much as possible. Then we'll use the greater than and our two parentheses to get that rigid body. Now we can modify things on it just like we did the gravity scale before. We can modify variables or we can call methods like add force. We wanna add a force which is going to force the thing or kind of push it. Adding force is like giving it a nudge or a giant launch or whatever in a specific direction. We specify the direction as a parameter by hitting the open parentheses and you can see that it takes a vector two named force. We're gonna give it our direction and magnitude and then we're gonna multiply this. Let's give it some sort of a launch power. Let's say times launch power. Now, I don't have a launch power. I just hit escape so it would stop trying to auto-complete. And I'm gonna now create a launch power variable. We'll create that right up here at the top. I'm gonna add a new line after six. And this time we're going to do something public. We're gonna make this variable public so we can modify it in the inspector. Say public. And here we're gonna use a math type or a number type that's a floating point variable. This is a number that can have decimal points. That's essentially what you need to know. Floating point numbers are fast numbers that computers and games often use for positions and other things because they're extremely fast to work with and they allow for decimal points. So we use a public float. You're gonna see that a lot. Float and int are the two that you're gonna see the most common. Int is the same but without, without the decimal points essentially. And it's gonna be named launch power. I'm going to give it a value of, oh, let's just go with five for now, and then we'll figure out how obscenely low that is later. Let's save. Oops. And then I accidentally hit control A to select all there. But once I save, look at the bottom right down here on line 18. I've got this little red squiggly. And before we continue on, I want you to just think for a moment, see if you can figure out why that squiggly line is there. If you figured it out on your own, drop a comment and let us know what it was. I'm kind of curious to see how many people catch it. And then if you haven't figured it out, it's okay. We just need to add the semicolon because that's the end of a statement where we're doing something, adding forces, a statement or an action, so we need a semicolon there. I'm gonna save, and now the favorite thing that I like to do is hit Control, Shift, and B to do a build. That actually saves all of my files. I only have one file, but it also verifies that I don't have any errors. See, if I got rid of this semicolon here and did a build, Control, Shift, B, I'll get this little pop-up here saying, hey, there's something wrong. A uh, semicolon was expected, and I can double-click on it, and it will tell me what the problem is, or exactly where the problem is, and to go add my semicolon. Sometimes the error messages aren't quite that obvious. Sometimes you do something like this, leave out your brace, and you do a build, and then it says, hey, there's a brace expected. Oh, wow, it's actually gotten a, 
It's obscenely smart, but it thinks that the brace should be down here at the bottom. And if I added that at the bottom, it's not going to fix it. It's just going to say that there's more errors because now these methods are inside of my on mouse up. Actually, it might actually work, which is even scarier because now these methods aren't actually going to get called. That's a new feature that they added where you can have methods inside of methods, um, but they're not going to get called automatically and that would be a big problem. So let's go fix the brace, put it right back here. And I'm going to hit my favorite hotkey in here, control K. Hold down control still and hit D, so it's control K, control D, which does a format cleanup and just fixes up my entire file. So this is what the entire file looks like right now. Let's go back into Unity, click on our bird and see if we can now launch them off. So we have to make sure we press play, make sure that I've saved my script, which I did a, a couple times there. Then we click on our bird as soon as it finishes. Drag and release, and you can see that the bird is flying up in that direction. If I click and drag up here and release, it goes kind of down that way, up here, goes that way, up here, it goes that way, and it's always kind of going towards that center point. Um, not really the behavior that I want. I want it to launch off much faster. So let's go look at our bird here again, and let's go adjust that launch power from a five to maybe a 50, and then we'll stop, or start again, sorry, and then play and drag our bird back and see that it kind of launches off. Now if the gravity scale was set to a one there, it would probably start to give us closer of an arc or closer of an arc that we want, an arc closer to what we want. So let's make a couple of modifications. We'll go select our bird again, collapse that rigid body, and we're gonna crank up this launch power to probably about 300. I've played around with numbers and I know that's, that's a more realistic number. Then we're gonna go back into the bird script and when we release, we're also going to set our gravity scale to one. So we're gonna do this line 32 here, right after line 18. They might be wondering, well, how do we do that? We just call update or something? Of course not, no. All we have to do is copy line 32, select that whole line, copy it, go to the end of line 18, paste with control V or command V or whatever your paste hotkey is. I'll save and do another build with that control shift B just to make sure everything worked. Now we'll go back into Unity and when I pull back and release my bird, I expect them to go flying. Let's see if that's the case. We got our bird, we launch them and yep, it went flying. That was probably a little bit too high. My numbers may have been off. Let's change that down to a 150 on the launch power. We'll play one more time and drag that. Bam, that's looking closer to what I want. And look at that, it goes bouncing away. Before we go on and add more features, I wanna dive into a couple quick pro tips. There are a few things that we've done here that there are slightly better ways to do that I would highly recommend that you get familiar with. The first here is our launch power. Right now we've modified the value to 150 in the inspector, but our default is still five. It's very important in my opinion to make sure that we keep our values somewhat in line, so I'm gonna change that default to 150. Another very important thing that you'll see often is that instead of of a public field like this public float, you'll have a private field that instead uses this special attribute. If I add a square brace, which is the key right next to P with no shift, and put a serialize field, and it's important I get the right one, there's serialize, serializable, serialize reference, I want serialize field, and then a closing brace, that will make it so that my value is modifiable in the inspector, but only in the inspector and not anywhere else. This doesn't really matter when you're just beginning, but it does matter as you start to get a little bit more advanced projects where things are, where you have more than one script and multiple scripts that are interacting with each other. And it essentially keeps your project or your code and not your project, your code, encapsulated, which is a big term for, it prevents other things that shouldn't be modifying your launch power from modifying your launch power. Again, not a huge deal. Technically it works exactly the same, but you're gonna see that a lot and it's important that you understand the serialized field and public are doing kind of the same thing. They're making it available in the inspector, but public is making it a little bit more available to other things. So the default is usually to use that serialized field attribute. Now we'll get into some other tips later, but for now let's save and go add something for our bird to knock over. We're gonna jump back into Unity and you probably remember those crates that were in our props folder. You may have already grabbed them and played with them a little bit, but let's take crate one and just drag it out into our scene. See that I've now got a crate right here at zero, 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 because I dropped it into the scene hierarchy. And I want this crate to be down here on the ground. So I'm just gonna set the value to, what is that gonna be like a negative three? 
0.5. Oh, what do you know? Guessed it out pretty good. And then finally, I'm going to add a collider to it. So I'll add a box collider 2D. I can't see that collider though because I'm in my game view. If I go to the scene view and switch back over to 2D mode, double click on that crate, I can now see that collider around it. If I turn off the renderer, it's even more visible. I can turn on and off that collider and see it highlight. All right, so I've got one crate there. Let's stack up a couple more crates. To do that, I'm going to duplicate this crate object. I'm going to hit Control D or Command D with it selected, and then I'm going to hit W to go to move mode. Hold down Control so I'm in that snapping mode. Watch my Y position go up by quarters as I Control drag this up and it goes up to negative two and a half. Now I'm still holding control, I'm just gonna hit D to duplicate again and keep dragging. D, duplicate again, keep dragging. D, duplicate again, keep dragging. Now I've got five crates all stacked up as a nice beautiful wall. Let's hit play and see if I can knock over those crates. I come over here, I grab my bird, I fly into him and bounce right off. If you've got a good idea of why that is, uh, drop it in the comments and let us know. If you're not sure though, don't worry, we're going to see the answer right now. So our crates have a collider on them, but they don't have a rigid body. And the rigid body is the thing that allows our objects to move around. So we're going to need to add a rigid body to each of our crates. I could do that by collapsing this box collider and hitting add component, searching for rigid body 2D, and then clicking on the next one and doing the same and so on and so on. Or I can select them all and I'm not going to select the first two because I've already added one to them. I can hold shift and hit down arrow, down arrow, select all three of those ones that are remaining, hit add component and add the rigid body there as well. Now this works for modifying values, removing components, adding components, even uh, disabling and enabling objects. See, I can turn all of them off, turn them all on. I can turn off their box colliders or anything else in a group just by selecting them all. It works for most components. Let's save and press play now and see what happens. There we go, we can see our boxes kind of settled on each other. I pull back and launch and I'm now knocking boxes over and everything's bouncing because my ground is, is, is super bouncy, but I think it's all uh, kind of working. We're getting close to the functionality we want and maybe this is bouncy birds instead. Now before we add monsters, I recommend you play with the crates a little bit. Maybe try swapping some crates out, change them from crate one to crate two. You could do alternating or whatever pattern you like, and then duplicate some crates, move them around, stack them up however you like, and even consider moving your bird. It doesn't have to be in that default position that we put it in. You can move it over here to the left or to the right or really wherever you want. In fact, if you want, you can even flip your bird on the Y axis, not the Y axis, the X axis here, and have it going the complete opposite direction. Make yourself a, a backwards, I guess like a left-handed angry bird. So I don't, I'm not really sure what that would be. And then launch at the, the boxes, start knocking things over, and we're gonna go to enemies next. For our enemies in this game, we're not using pigs, but instead we've got these cute little monsters. This monster with a purple eye that opens and closes. And we're going to use this guy by clicking on both of the sprites and dragging them out. That's going to do, guess what? Yep, create a new animation. We'll call this Monster Purple just to match his name. And now we're gonna have a monster purple that's placed right here on top of our boxes and totally not usable. But if I drag him up right here, I can have him sitting on top of my blocks and have him just be the target that we wanna knock out. Of course, if I just press play now, he's not gonna do anything because he doesn't have the collider or rigid body components that we need. He also doesn't have any scripts on him. So let's add a collider and rigid body component first. We'll add the rigid body 2D leave it at all the default settings. And then we're gonna add a polygon collider 2D. Remember that's the one that matches up with our sprite shape. Zoom in, you can see it kind of wrapped around him. Let's save and press play. And now we should have a nice animating little character. It's probably gonna animate a little too fast. Yep, he's going a little wild, but that's okay. We know how to fix that. Remember, we'll just open up our animator, double click on the controller to get the animator window. Notice that this is animator, animation is down there. We'll go select that monster animation. I'm gonna move it, just clicking and dragging it doesn't do anything other than moving it on the canvas. I'm just gonna move it over here to the right though, so it's not on top of that any state thing. And then we'll adjust that speed. We'll change this to maybe a 0.2 like we did with the other one. So it takes about, I don't know, however long that is to get through. Let's go to game view, 
Yeah, that looks good. So now he's blinking up and down. I can click and drag and launch my bird and look at that. Well, it didn't actually knock him down, but if I stop and play again, I can probably click and launch my bird. Let's, let's try it. So I'll play, click, drag, launch my bird, and look at that, I knocked down that big scary monster. All right, and there are one or two important things to note here. I guess one really important thing, and that's that while I changed this speed variable while we were playing and everything worked even after I stopped playing, if I play and I make other changes, changes to things that are in the scene, for instance, if I went to this monster right here and I just removed his or disabled his animator completely, removed or disabled his polygon collider so he falls down. If I stop playing, those settings will get reset. Settings to things that are in your level always get reset when you stop playing, but these animator controllers, if I click on it, you'll see that it's actually a project asset down here in the project. It's not part of the scene. It's just associated with something in the scene, so changes to those assets sets do stay across the, the view. So if it's something that you can kind of click through and see down here in the project view and you click on it and modify it, like we do here, we double click on it to view it, those changes do stay across, but changes to scene objects do not. Now that we've stopped playing, let's add some more code and turn our enemy into something that can be destroyed. To do that, we're going to create our second script. We're gonna take a deeper look at scripting and code. We're gonna go into the scripts folder and then right click, choose create, choose C sharp script to make a new script. And we're gonna call this one enemy with a capital E, E-N-E-M-Y. Now the reason that we use a capital E is because that's the standard in C sharp. Our classes are typically in a Pascal case, which is where every first letter or the first letter of every word is capitalized. The alternative to that is camel case, which is what you saw here with our starting position, where the first word is lowercase and all of the words are after that are uppercase or, yeah, use an uppercase. So it's similar to Pascal case, except for the first letter is lowercase. That's camel case. All right, so here's our enemy script. Now, if you've never used a code editor before, you may have noticed that I clicked over here to get to the enemy. You can click back and forth between the different tabs of your code just by clicking up here, but you can usually also hit Control K to do a quick search, or sometimes double tap Shift, depending on what your editor is. And you can find all of your files that way, or go to the Solution Explorer and expand out this Assembly C Sharp, and then Assets, and then whichever folders have scripts in them will show up here, since the only folder that we have that has scripts right now is the Scripts folder. That's the only one that we see, but we see our bird script and our enemy right there as well. So if you're trying to find them, you can look for that Solution Explorer, Control, Comma, or Control K to do searches, um, or you can uh, double shift depending on your code editor. So now that we have our enemy script, we're gonna make a couple changes. First thing is that we don't need anything in our start or update method. And the typical response for me when I create a new script and I don't need something in a start or an update right away is to just delete them because I know they exist and I know that if I want to use them, I can always come back and re-add them, but having them there just kind of clutters things up and makes it a little bit harder for me to see what's actually going on. So I'm gonna select line seven through 17 and then hit delete. Let's see, let's try that again. Line seven through 17 and backspace, there we go. I clicked away just a little bit. Now we're gonna add a method to deal with our collisions. What I want is a method that will give me some info whenever an object hits my enemy. And that method is the on collision enter 2D method. Remember, we have to choose the 2D ones because we're working in 2D. If we had a regular rigid body, we would want the on collision enter, but here we want on collision enter 2D. I'm gonna hit enter and let it automatically generate. And then I'm gonna get rid of that redundant private keyword. <clears throat> now in our collision, the first thing that I'm gonna do is just check to see if we were hit by a bird. If we were hit by a bird, we're going to destroy our enemy or just make it disappear or whatever, maybe give the player some points, whatever type of thing we might wanna do. But first we need to make sure that it was actually hit by a player. So to do that, we're gonna use another if statement, just like we did before. Let's go back and look at that bird. 
Remember on the bird, we said if, and then we used parentheses, and we checked to see if the Q key was pressed. We're going to do the same thing. I'm going to go back with my back hotkey. We're going to do the same thing right here and check to see if the thing that hit us was a bird. We'll say if, and then open parentheses, and we need to use this collision 2D object that was passed in. This collision 2D object is a parameter of the onCollisionEnter 2D method that's passed to us automatically whenever a collision happens in our game. Well, whenever a 2D collision happens in our game with this enemy object, so with an object that has this enemy script on it. So on this collision, we can check the object that hit it by using the collision, and that autocorrect is not correct, so say collision dot collider dot, we want to use the get component method. This is the same get component method that we used on the bird to get the rigid body before. We're going to use that get component method though this time to get the bird component. So we'll give it the type of bird. And to give it the type, remember we need the less than and greater than symbols around it. Then, of course, we need the open close parentheses, which gets a little confusing because we've got that other parenthesis right there. But when we get the bird, now what's going to happen is if this bird exists, if it's able to get a bird here, the line of code after this will run. If it's not able to find a bird here, no bird is found, this if statement will be evaluated as false and the line of code after it won't run. So if it does get a bird, what we'll do is just destroy our own game object. So we'll call the destroy method. And we don't want to destroy the collision.collider. We want to destroy our own game object. Game object here is a reference to the game object that this enemy is attached to. It's an automatically added property from this mono behavior. So we get it here automatically. And this is kind of the default way to just destroy a game object from a script that's attached to it. Now let's save this enemy script and go attach it to our enemy. Here's our enemy, and this time I'm going to use the add component method. I'll do add component, search for enemy, and hit enter, and now I've got my enemy script added. I could also drag it on there, but I want to do it multiple different ways. I'll save my scene, get rid of that star just in case anything goes wrong, make sure that my changes are saved. And here we are in game. I can now drag back and launch and my enemy doesn't die. But if I try again and this time I actually hit the enemy dead on, I expect that he'll explode or at least disappear. Let's see if that's the case. Okay, I'm not very good at dragging him. So what I'm going to do now is just cheat. I'm going to take my enemy and just set him right down here and then drop my bird on top of him. There we go, he disappears. So he disappears when he's hit by the bird, but not when he just fell to the ground. And let's go take one more look at that code. Here it is. So again, the reason that he only disappears when he's hit by a bird is because we do this check to see if the collider that hit him has a bird component on it. If that's true, then we call the destroy method. What if we want to destroy him just for falling down too far or too fast though? There are some other methods or other things that we can read on this collision to check that and maybe check how fast he was falling or how fast that impact was or how hard that impact was and then destroy him if he is over that some set velocity or some amount that we determine. To do that, we'll make another if statement. So I'm going to go down here. I'm going to add a little bit of space just for cleanliness to make it so I can see and read this a little bit easier. Say if collision dot relative velocity. And here I need the dot magnitude value. If that is greater than, and here we'll give it some maximum impact magnitude. Let's call this a... Uh, destroy impact magnitude, then we'll destroy our game object. Look at that, my autocomplete just automatically found it and I just hit tab. If yours doesn't, that's okay, you can type it out. And now our destroy impact magnitude doesn't exist. So we're gonna need a field for it that we can modify in the inspector and adjust to see exactly how fast we want these things to blow up at when they fall. Because if they fall slowly, it probably shouldn't count, but if they fall at some relatively good speed, it should destroy them. And with the variable, we'll be able to adjust that at runtime. Let's hit Alt Enter, and we can now generate a field called Destroy Impact Magnitude. It's going to give us a private float, but we don't want a private one. We want something that we can modify in the inspector. 
And I already told you that we can make it public to do that, but the better way to do it is, of course, that serialize field attribute. We'll add that in with that closing square brace at the end, and then I'm gonna give it a default value of maybe five. I'm not sure if that's a good value, but I'm gonna stick with it for now. All right, now we're back in the inspector, and I'm gonna drag this monster up so he's just a little bit above this box. I want him to fall on that box, make sure that he doesn't destroy himself, that that impact magnitude value is high enough that he won't just destroy himself from kind of plopping down onto the box, and then we'll blow up the box or knock it over and see if the guy dies when he falls down at a much better speed, which we should probably expect to happen. Let's grab the bird. Drag, release, and he goes plopping down, and look at that, our game is just about working. Now I wanna make a little adjustment to our bird because I feel like the variable, or the amount that he's launching is still a little bit too low. 300 was too high, 150 is too low. I'm gonna go with a 250, somewhere that's a little bit closer to that higher end. Save, play, and try it one more time. I'd recommend that you play around with this value a little bit and see what feels good to you for a launch amount, because in just a moment, we're going to add restrictions on how far away our bird can be drugged or dragged or whatever the correct word is. If you know the correct word, can you drop that in the comments? Because I'm not sure which one it is. Okay, let's go into our bird script now and add a maximum distance that it can go away, whichever one that was. To do that, we're gonna go into our, well, first, let's go up to the top of our bird class and let's take a look at a couple things and add a new serialized field for how far away we can drag things. So, or how far away we can drag our bird, I guess. So the first thing I wanna mention is right up at the top of the script, we have these three lines that I haven't mentioned or talked about yet. One says using system.collections, one says using system.collections.generic, and the other says using Unity Engine. If you have something else here, it's because you auto-completed and your editor automatically put in the wrong thing. You might have a using Unity Editor or Unity System.Numerics or something weird. You shouldn't, just make sure that it matches this. Now the important other thing to note here is that these two grade outlines mean that they're not actually used, which means that I've told the code here or Unity by default, told the code here that we might need to use these collection things that are part of the system namespace, which is this very generic setup of things to keep track of objects. It's for having lists or queues or stacks of objects, which are just different ways to store sets of objects that are somewhat more advanced and a little bit beyond the scope of what we need to talk about right now. But since they're not used and they're grayed out, I can actually go up to them and hit shift and delete to delete both of those lines. This other line here using Unity Engine just means that we're going to be using things that are part of Unity in our class, like the mono behavior, which is a big key piece of Unity and the way that most things work, at least in the standard way of using Unity. So we're gonna add our new field inside of our bird class now that we've cleaned up code and removed a couple unused lines. And we're gonna put that right above our launch power. We're gonna add a new line here by hitting enter right after that little brace there, adding a serialized field attribute. And we're gonna add a float. Remember that's a number that can have decimal points. And we're gonna call this um, max drag distance. And we're gonna assign it a value of, let's go with four. So that'll be four meters or four units away. Or you can think of it in this case about four times the length or size of our bird away because our bird is one unit in size. So four should be about four birds away from the starting point, how far we can drag it. Now to make that uh, restriction actually work, we're gonna need to use this max drag distance. So I'm gonna double click on it and hit control C to copy it onto my clipboard because I don't wanna type it again and that'll save me a little bit of time. Now in my on mouse drag method, what we'll do is check our distance from our destination to our, or from our current position to our destination. And if that's greater than our drag distance, then we'll just clamp it at that drag distance. Let's see how we'll do that. After line 24, we're gonna add a new line. We're gonna say if vector two dot distance, here we're doing a vector two dot distance even though we are using vector threes just because we don't care about that Z value, we're ignoring it and we, we've already set it to zero. But we're gonna go from our destination to our starting position 
If that value is greater than our max drag distance, like that it's auto completing for us, then we're gonna change our destination to not be its current value, but instead use this method called vector3 dot move towards. Now move towards takes in a starting position. So here we'll put in starting position. And then we move towards a destination, some max distance. Those are the three parameters and those kind of match up with our variables. So it's gonna move our bird or our final target destination to the point that's furthest at that max distance along the line towards our destination. Let's save now and go back into Unity and see exactly how that works. Works. All right, here we are. So I can drag around and oh, that distance might be a little bit too big. Let's adjust it. So we'll stop playing. I'm going to turn this drag distance down to maybe a value of two. I think four might have been. I think my calculation was off. These guys are not quite the size I was thinking. Drag it back and launch and Okay, that's pretty good, but now it probably needs a little bit more launch power. So I'll crank that up to 350 since I clamped that drag distance down to two. So with a two value there and a 350, let's pull it up back all the way and see what that looks like. Yeah, that's probably a good amount of force and I'm able to take out my enemy. Now let's take a look at this outline circle. If you've been wondering what it's for, you're about to find out. If you have a guess though, drop it in the comments. I'm curious to see if everybody has a good idea already of what we're putting in. Well, what it's gonna be is an indicator of what direction our bird is launching. If you play Angry Birds, you pull back and you've got that little uh, launcher, what's that thing called? Uh, I forgot the name already, drop it in the comments. Um, thing where you launch the bird out of, but we give it a nice indicator of what direction the bird's gonna go. So we're gonna add something similar. To do that, we need another component. We're gonna go to the bird and we're gonna add in the line renderer component. First, let's collapse the animator and the bird script down so that we can see just the space for the add component button. And then we'll search for a line, L-I-N-E, and find line renderer. It's best to just search for it, and find it the easiest way to grab it. We'll click on it and that's gonna add a line renderer to our bird, but it's not going to show us anything by default. The reason for that is if we go into the scene view, oh look at that, we've got a little purple thing here. We can see this is, I guess, a little weird line, and it's only visible in the scene view because the values for it are set by this positions array. And the only value that's changed for the second point of our line is the Z value. If I set that back to a zero, you have to expand out positions to see this. And then set the X to maybe a five. Now I can see a nice pink line going across here. If I go back into my game view, I can see a nice pink line here too. Now we're gonna adjust this pink line and turn it into being a yellow, or not a yellow, an outlined circle. By the way, if you know why this is a pink line, drop that in the comments too. I'm really curious to see how many people know what the reason for that is. All right, to do this, we're gonna to need to create a new material and assign it to this material section of the line renderer. You can see that down here near the bottom. It's collapsed sometimes by default. You may have to expand it and you should see a material section. It'll either be set to none or default. If I hit the search box, I can find a couple options here, but none of these look right. And go click through them and see what they kind of look like here. None of that is what I want, I want my dots. So to create a material for my dots, I'm gonna go into my UI folder, I'm already here, right click and choose create, and we're gonna create a material. Now a material is the thing that the graphics card or the engine uses really to tell the graphics card how to render something. It's a combination of textures, one or more, or sometimes even zero, and different variables and settings, like a shader. It's a shader plus some set of variables added on. So let's hit material, and we're gonna create a new material named outlined circle. Now I said that it's got textures, one or more, and some variables. You can see those right here. We've got a diffuse, a mask, and a normal map. And they've each got a couple variables like their tiling values and their offsets, which allow you to do tiled pictures or tiled images where things tile along, just like our ground did. And then we've got a render queue down below. We're not gonna get too deep into that. Some GPU instancing options and other things. But the important part that we have here, the most important part, is this shader at the top. Each material is going to have a shader, and the shader is the thing that does the actual rendering of the graphics. The material just provides that shader 
with all the information and kind of an interface back and forth into Unity. We're going to change the shader by clicking on the drop down here and going to Universal Render Pipeline, and then we're going to choose Unlit. We don't want to choose the 2D options. We need to go with this Unlit one specifically for the sprite renderer. Now, in our surface inputs, we now have a base map field. It's slightly different, and that's got a color option and tiling and offsets. You're going to find tiling and offsets pretty much everywhere. Let's take the outline circle and drag it into the base map section. Now you'll see that I've got a bunch of dots there, but the only reason I have a bunch of dots and you don't have a bunch of dots is because I accidentally already left this texture mode switched over to tile. By default, it's on stretch and it looks like this. If you go over to your bird, select your line renderer, and then find the texture mode and switch that to tile, you see that you've now got a nice set of little white dots that we can use to give our player an indication of where the bird's gonna go. To make that happen though, we're gonna need to modify the bird script and have it adjust the points in the line renderer. Let's open up the bird script now. First thing we wanna do is get a reference to that line renderer. This is another one of those pro tips. If we're going to be using a component often, we should cache it. And by caching it, I mean we should get it in our start method or sometimes the awake method. Either one will work in this case though. And then use that reference to it instead of calling get component every single time we need to use that object. Just like we do with our on mouse up here, we've got this get component method or this get component call. We're gonna need to do the same thing with the line renderer, but I only wanna do it once, so I'll do it right here and start. Let's type that out and see what it looks like. First, we'll zoom in. We'll add a line here after the beginning of start. Say under, or not underscore, but lowercase, line renderer, and I'm gonna hit escape so it doesn't autocomplete, equals get component, and I'm gonna let this autocomplete and get the line renderer component. That's going to cache it into this line renderer variable. Now that variable does not exist, that's why it's underlined in red, but if I hit Alt Enter, I can generate a field and now I've got a variable for it right there. And that's the way I would normally add it, to keep it nice and quick. I don't like to type these things out, I let it auto-generate as much as possible. Now I'm gonna double click on that private keyword just to get rid of it so that everything looks the same because again, it is redundant. Now that we've got our line renderer, the first thing I wanna do is set that first position, position zero, to be our starting position, which is also the same as our transform position. So I'll say line renderer dot set position, and we're going to set the position at index zero. That's the one that has a zero next to it in the inspector. We're gonna give it a value of transform dot position. Now I could also just do this right after setting the starting position and assign the starting position variable there. It's not gonna matter, it's the exact same value either way, just know that it works both ways. The other piece of code that I need to do is in our on mouse drag. When we move our bird around, we wanna set the position of the other position or the other point of our line renderer, point two, to be our new position of our bird so that it follows us around. To do that, we'll add another line here at the bottom, and we'll just say line renderer dot set position. You're probably guessing what's next, an open parentheses, an index of one, because we want that second point, and we're gonna give it our value or our position of transform dot position. Now, why is this okay? Why is this uh, giving us a nice line? Because remember, the start method is only called once at the beginning of the game. So it's gonna be called right at the beginning and set that position of point zero right at the start. And then anywhere that we move the bird when we're dragging it along is the only thing that will get, or will get put into position one and nothing else will change. Now I'll save, get rid of the little star here. We'll go back into Unity, we'll press play and we should have a nice beautiful line that indicates where our bird is going to fly. Let's try it out. By the way, if this is helpful, don't forget to hit the like and subscribe buttons. All right, let's drag, shoot. Look at that, our bird launched. We'll press play, I wanna see it one more time. I think this time I'm gonna give my bird a little bit further drag distance. I'm gonna do this while playing though, so I'm gonna change this to a three. Click and drag, like that I get about three dots worth. That looks good. And then I can launch, boom, and knock out the enemy. Let's stop playing. Remember that value gets reverted because I changed it in play mode and it was on a scene object. So I'm gonna change that back to a three and save. 
Next, we're going to make more levels and get into how we can transition between levels. But before we do, we need to dive into one really important concept, and that is the concept of reusable objects or reusable prefabs. That's what they're called in Unity, and they're essentially prefabricated game objects that you can reuse across scenes or even in the same scene. There are a lot of benefits to them, but the core one is that you don't have to recreate objects over and over. And if you make changes to a prefab, you can have it apply to all of the instances of it in your game, not just one of them. You won't have to go back and modify them all independently. If I make a prefab out of my monster here, and I want to change the destroy impact magnitude, I won't have to go to every single monster and modify that value in every single level. I'll be able to do that in one single object. Let's take a look at the process for creating a prefab. The first thing we're gonna do is take our monster and rename it. I don't like the name monster purple closed. Let's call this monster enemy. Now we're gonna create a folder to store our prefabs in. We'll go to the assets folder, right click on the empty space, choose create, hit folder, and pick or type prefab. Now we can put prefabs wherever we want, but I like to put them in a prefabs folder. I forgot the S there almost. So we'll add a prefabs folder and open it up. To create a prefab, we just take an object that's in our scene hierarchy here, click on it and drag, and then drop it in down here in the project view. That will turn it blue up here and make it appear down here as a prefab object. Notice that I've got it selected in the project view now and I see it in my inspector. This view is a little bit different than if I select the instance of my prefab right here. Here you'll see I've got the normal visualization that you saw, visualization that you saw. And if I go down to the prefab, you see it says root in prefab open for full editing support. I can actually open this monster edit monster enemy prefab in a unique or exclusive edit mode and modify it there. Let's go to the scene view double click on the monster enemy and go to 2D mode so I can see it. You can see here that I've got just the monster open. I can go back in the hierarchy and I can of course double click on it again to, to view it or I can go back in the hierarchy and I can hit this arrow here on the instance of it to go into prefab edit mode for it as well. I don't know why I'm still in 3D mode though so let's get back into 2D mode. So now that I've got my monster enemy there, what can I do with it? Who cares, right? What, it made it blue, what does that matter? Well, watch this. Now I can take my monster enemy out of my prefabs folder, drag it out here, and I've got another monster that has the enemy script, the collider, the rigid body, the animator, and everything else. I don't have to recreate it. I got another one, look at that, I've got another one. And if I wanna duplicate it, of course I can do that. So I hit duplicate and W, control D, or command D is duplicate. W is move. Control D again and move. I've got a whole bunch of enemies. Let's press play. All right, all my enemies fell, but you saw that that other one died because he had a value of five and apparently five is not quite enough. It needs to be a little bit higher to avoid that guy from dying from a five. So this needs to be like a six or something. But I don't know if I want to just change it on this guy. Well, let's do that. Let's just change it on him, on him alone. Press play, we'll see if six is good. So if, if he's falling with, okay, six is fine. He, he lands fine with the six. So we're gonna need to change this to six for all of our enemies. Now again, we could just go batch select them, go all the way down and modify them. But I said, we're gonna make new levels. Do we wanna do that in every level? Maybe if we got one or two levels, but eventually we're not gonna wanna do it that way. Instead, we can go to the prefab down here, change this value to six. Now look at the, all these other instances. There are already six. Now there's another way to do this, you may have seen. If I wanted it to be seven, say I changed this enemy value to be seven, I can also go to overrides and hit apply all to apply that value to the prefab. So now I go to the prefab, it's seven, and all of the instances are at seven as well. Now that we've got our prefab, let's make that other level I was talking about. First, let's save level one with control S, get rid of that little star, and then go into our scenes folder. Remember, that's where we keep all of our scenes, and scenes are essentially levels, although you can also think of some scenes like you can have a main menu scene, a game over scene. Sometimes these are all in one scene. A lot of games are built in a single scene, but in our scenario, we're gonna switch between levels and scenes so you can see that process as well. Now we've got level one here, but we wanna create a level two. We've got a couple options. I can just do file, 
save as and save this as level two and that will create a new level for me. I can also go select the scene object here and I can hit control D and duplicate it and look at that. Now it actually named it level two automatically because it knew that after one I probably wanted two and automatically followed a simple naming convention. Now level two is created, but it is not open. Look up here in the hierarchy, level one is the open level. So we have to open our scene up. To do that, we can double click on it and now it's open, but they look exactly the same. How are you gonna tell there's a difference? Well, let's make a couple little changes here. Let's first take our summer background here and just move it over a little bit. I think that'll work a little bit and maybe we'll scale it. Instead of being a one, 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 let's make it a one, Let's make it a 1.2 and a 1.2 so that it scales a little bit different, has a slightly different view. Now if I save and I click between level one and level two, let's see, level two, I can see that they're, they're definitely different levels, even though I have all the same objects in them. Next, we'll move some stuff around. So we've got our enemies. Let's just clear out all of these extra enemies. I'll take enemies one through five, select them all and delete them. <gasps> okay we can easily add them remember you know how to do that now and then we'll do something with our crates let's just um i don't know maybe add a whole bunch more crates i'll select all of the crates here duplicate them all together with control or command d and then drag them over so i've got a whole second set of crates now i'm not a great level designer i just know how to write code and teach people how to write code so you can spend all the time you want building out a beautiful, fun level, and I'll show you how to hook up the rest of it. Now that we've got our crates there, let's duplicate this enemy. Maybe put one on top of each crate. And save our game. Now if I press play, I should be in level two. Let's see here, I play, I drag my bird back, I launch, and oh, I took them almost all out, except for that guy that fell off the scene, the screen. I can't really see him, so I'm not sure what happened. And, well, I don't switch back and forth between levels. That was level two. If I wanna play level one, I've gotta go open it, press play, and then play through. And that's fun and all for me, but probably not for my players. So let's modify this so that we can transition between levels automatically and beat the game. Before we dive into code, let's simplify level one so that it is easy for me to beat. I'm gonna delete monsters one through five. So we just have our monster and the bird out here, the single monster would be a lot easier for me to beat it in testing and for you as well. Now that we've got our monster here, let's open up our bird script. In our bird script, all we'll do is check to see if all of the monsters are dead, and if they are, we'll continue on to the next level. To do that, we'll add an if statement, and we're gonna find any object by type, give it the type here of enemy, again, using that less than and greater than syntax around the type, and we've gotta go over one space and add our open parentheses, and here we actually need to give it a parameter. It wants a find objects in active enum. And an enum is essentially a set of options or an option that you can pick to give things a name instead of having just a random number or something that you had to guess. So we can hit enter and it actually gives us an automatic uh, autocomplete if I hit dot afterwards. So it's find objects inactive dot, and we can either choose include or exclude. I want to exclude inactive objects. So we'll use that, and if that finds nothing, it will return null. I accidentally added an extra parentheses there, so we'll double check it, or we'll check it by saying if it double equals, that's how we do an equality comparison, to see if something is equal instead of assigning something. A single equals assigns, a double equals does an equality comparison, a triple equals does nothing. This is C-sharp, not JavaScript. So if it equals null, then that means that there are no enemies that aren't inactive and we want to win the game. So let's start by using that debug log that we played with earlier. I'm gonna say debug.log quotes game over. And of course at the end we've got that red line because we need a semicolon. We'll add that, save our code, and then go into Unity. And now when we destroy our enemy, our last enemy on the scene, we should expect to see a game over log in our console. Once we have that, we can figure out how to load a level from there. 
Let's see if that's the case. By the way, when you're developing and you're getting into things and you're not sure how to do the next step, just add a log. Add a log for what the next thing is going to be, get to that point, and then write the code for it afterwards once you figured out the, the way to get to the point that you need to get to. Here we go. We launch our bird. Enemy falls. And I totally failed in killing him, so let's try again. We're almost there, let's get him, we aim and get him right in the head and look at that, we've got a game over and it's getting logged out every frame. So that's not a big deal though because we're gonna load the next level as soon as this happens next time or as soon as we write the code for it. All right, let's stop playing and go write the code for it. Now to load the next level, we need to figure out what level we're currently on and then just figure out the next level in that index or the next level number or le level order. Well, that's pretty easy to do, but we're gonna need to do more than one thing in here. Right now on line 40, if we find no enemies, we only do the line after it, which is this debug log. We wanna do multiple things after this, and we can do that by simply adding some braces. And if you've been adding braces the whole time, that's fine. You can add braces around single line statements, but I prefer not to just because it adds more spacing to the code, it makes it a little bit harder for me to read. In this case, though, we wanna do multiple things, so we'll add some braces. To do that, I'll go to the end of line 40 and hit enter, then add in opening brace, which is shift in the key next to P. I'm gonna hit delete, and then go down to the end of this and hit a closing brace. That way I get the braces all lined up and my editor kind of automatically aligned everything. Now this as it stands will run exactly the same. It'll just write that log for game over. It's just running the statement inside these braces, meaning that I can put more code inside of them. So let's put some extra code after this debug log. The first thing that I wanna do is figure out what level I'm currently on. And I can get that information from the scene manager. We can access it with the scene manager API, just not actually the scene manager API one there, but this scene manager. So we use scene manager dot, I guess that was a little confusing on the wording, but scene manager dot get active scene, which is going to get our currently loaded and active scene. Now you can have multiple scenes active or loaded at once, but only one will be active at once. And right now we're only ever gonna have one loaded and active, so you don't need to worry too much about that. But we're gonna get the active scene, which of course requires our open close parentheses, and we wanna get the build index. That's the number of the level. So it's gonna be zero, one, two, three, four, and you're gonna see all of those in just a moment when we go into the build settings. But we wanna get that value and we wanna have whatever the value is plus one. So we're gonna to need to store that off into a variable. How could we store this build index plus one off into a variable? I want you to pause now and go ahead and see if you can figure that out yourself. I've been doing a little bit of coding. How would you add that variable right here? Go ahead and think about it. And now let's do it together. So to do it, we're gonna add in a new variable, but build index is an integer. So it'll have to be of type integer, or if you just went with var, that would work as well. So we could say var, index equals scene manager dot get active scene dot build index plus one. That's gonna be the index that we wanna load or the level that we want to load. In fact, let's rename that. Let's call this level to load. I hit control R, control R gives me the rename option or you could just type over it since there are no references to it. And I'll call this level to load. I like that name better and I think that, oops, let's try that again level two load, I think good naming is very, very important. Now let's load that level. To do that, we'll use the scene manager again. And we use dot load scene. Oops, there we go, get that typed in right. And then we'll pass in our level to load. Load scene takes two optional ways to call it. We can either pass in the index of the level or the name of the level, and here we're using that index. We're taking the currently loaded index, adding one to it, storing that off in a variable, or I could put in here an integer because that's what it is, and then we're loading the scene with the next index. Let's save and go hook that up so that it actually works. And by hook that up, I mean that we need to go into our build settings. We're gonna go to file, as soon as it loads up, and then build settings. Here we have a list of scenes in our build. Right now we have that sample scene that we deleted and nothing else, that's not what we want. So we're gonna select the sample scene in there and hit the delete key, that should remove it. Then we're going to hit add open scenes. That should add level one because we have level one open. We also want level two in there though, so let's go to the project view. 
Let's go find our scenes and take level two and drag that in as well. We'll save. And I also want to go now to file and hit save project. That forces this build settings to save just in case the power goes out or something crazy and your project crashes. You want to make sure that that stuff gets saved. Now we'll press play. Let's take out this monster and see if we can progress to the next level. Look at that. We're now on to level two. And here we go. Did I beat level two? Nope, not quite. But we're getting close. Now to complete our gameplay loop, all we really need to do is make our bird reset after he fails to kill everybody or fails to knock out all of the enemies. If I land and miss, I should have some set number of retries or maybe a variable number that you can modify in the inspector before we lose the game all in all or have to just kind of continue. Or we could maybe continue over and over and over, but we at least want to reset the bird back to its main position after some amount of time. We also probably want that line renderer to only show up when we're dragging and then disappear afterwards. So let's make those changes now. We're going to open up our bird script and let's start with the line renderer because it's one of the smaller changes. On our mouse up, we can just disable that line renderer object. We can say line renderer dot enabled equals false. Then on our mouse down, we can say that line render enabled is equal to true. Or we could just do that in on mouse drag so that we don't have to add another method. To do that, we'll just copy line 23. I select the entire line there, holding shift and clicking to the beginning, or at the beginning, holding shift and clicking to the end, and then hit control C or whatever your copy hotkey is, could be command C if you're on a Mac. And then in the on mouse drag, I'll paste and change the false to true. What that's going to do is exactly the same thing as toggling this object on and off or this component on and off by clicking that box. Let's go press play and see it. So we jump in. Our line renderer is on by default because we haven't done anything with the default value. I click on it, it stays on, and I release it, and it turns off. Now, I also want it to turn off from the start, so let's back, back go back into our code and copy this line here, line 23, one more time, and paste it up into our start so that our line renderer turns off automatically from the beginning as well as setting that position. We'll save one more time, go back into Unity, and if I'm already playing, it should try to reload and replay, but it may run into some issues. So typically what you're gonna to wanna to do is stop playing and then play again. And now we should see the proper results of our line renderer disabling. I click and drag and it shows up and I release and it disables again. Same thing on the next level, because it's all done in code, it just kind of works. Now when we get to the end of this level, let's zoom out and take a look. The other enemy was gone, but there was no level to load because it says scene with build index two couldn't be loaded because it hasn't been added to the build settings. This just means that I ran out of levels to load. If that's the case, we can always loop back over to the first level or go to a game over scene. I would recommend that you just add a game over scene right at the end of the game. In fact, if you hit thumbs up, we'll do that right at the end of the video. Now let's stop playing and make our bird reset on a failure. Because right now if I play and I just drop my bird down, well, my game's kind of messed up and I can't really do anything else because my bird never resets. Well, there I didn't fail. But here if I fail like this, my bird's all wonky and I can kind of like click and drag him, get it, but it gets weird. Um, and it doesn't really do what I want it to do. I want it to go back to that starting position after a couple seconds of hitting the ground or something similar. So let's stop playing and we'll go into our bird script. And inside of our bird script, we're also going to deal with a collision enter. And then five seconds after the first time we touch something, we're just going to restart the level. We'll just reload our current scene. To do that, we're gonna add a new method here and let's do it right at the bottom of our script, below the update method. We'll go down to line 52 and add an on collision. Guess what it's gonna be? Enter 2D, that's right. On a collision enter 2D, we're going to invoke another method after some delay. And that method is going to just reload our current level. So we'll say invoke reload level 
and then we'll give it a default value or a value of five. Now this doesn't work. It wants a string here and a string is essentially a word in quotation marks. So if we put reload level in quotation marks, this will work and then when we try to run it, it will tell us that there is no method named reload level because what this is really representing is a string saying the name of a method that we want to call. There's another way to do this that's even better that keeps it safe and allows us to pass in a value here. First though, let's create a method called reload level and then I'll show you how to use it. We're gonna add a void reload level right down below. Remember this is outside the parentheses of the on collision enter. We'll add our open close parentheses or the squiggly braces. And then in the squiggly braces here, we're going to do scene manager dot load scene. And now we want to load our currently active scene. Do you remember how to get that? Think about it for a moment. Go ahead, you drop it in the comments if you want. And then put it in here. It's scene manager dot get active scene dot build index. So if we pass that in as a parameter, what will happen is it'll actually get this active scene, get the build index, and then create that, at, get that as an integer and pass it into this load scene method. So we can stack these method calls inside of parameters and it'll essentially be resolved in reverse order. So this will get figured out what that build index is. And it'll get passed into load scene. Now this invoke will work if we try to run it, but the thing that I like to do, another I guess third pro tip of the video, is instead of putting this in quotation marks, there's a special method called name of. You put name of there and open parentheses, and then you can give it a method and close parentheses, and it will just convert that to a string for the invoke method. Again, both ways work. I just prefer this because then if I renamed this to reload level again or something stupid like that, it would rename automatically in there. If I put it in quotation marks as a string, it probably won't catch it. Some editors occasionally will, but most of the time it won't, so the name of function exists primarily for that reason. Now that we've got it in here, we should be able to save and then go back into Unity. And now if I drop my bird down after five seconds, that reload level method should invoke. If I haven't already gone into the next level and then it'll kick us into, or reload us back to the beginning of our level. So here we go, we'll just kind of like launch down to the side. Do, 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 five seconds, oh, I'm probably gonna beat the level. Here we go though, we won't be at level two. After five seconds, we reload. And if I lose again, actually trying, I reload again. Now that our core game loop is working, the last thing we need to do is add an intro and then give ourselves a build so that we can share this with friends or put it onto our own devices and show off what we've done. Let's start by creating a loading screen. To do that, we're gonna go into our game over menu or our game over scene, and we're just gonna duplicate it. We're gonna create another one. This will be like the pre-game scene, the one where they're sitting there and they wait to hit play to, to actually start. So let's duplicate our game over scene with control or command. And D. Now I've got a game over and a game over one. I don't want to call this game over one though. Let's just call this uh, start. I'll name it S T A R T. The specific name doesn't really matter, but I think it's important to have something that kind of tells us what it is. Now we're gonna open up that start scene and it's gonna look exactly the same. The only thing that looks different is right up here in the hierarchy. And it's important to pay attention to what scene you have open because it has happened more than once where I've been working in a scene, made a bunch of changes and then realized, oops, this was the wrong level or the wrong scene. Didn't realize I was working in it because they looked so similar or maybe even exactly the same. Now I wanna change out the background art and the button and the text right here. Let's start with the background art. I'll go to my art folder and I'm gonna drag in this new image that I generated with Midjourney. Now you can use whatever image you generate or pick or create or download or whatever you want. You can put in pretty much any texture as long as it's a PNG or a JPEG or another supported image file. Usually I just go with PNG files though and I'll open them in a text or an image editor and then save them out as PNGs. This is what mine looks like. You're welcome to download it in the description or on the page below. And once you have it, you can just go to your canvas and go find the image here and then assign the bird fly instead of the bird eyes. Now we've got a slightly different screen for when we're ready to start playing. Now let's call this bouncy birds. I think that's a better name than mad birds. 
because my my birds are bouncing. And then I want to change this button too. I want this button to just say play, not play again, or um, maybe play or start the challenge, accept challenge. I, I'm not sure exactly what I want it to say, but I'm gonna auto size the font so that it shrinks back down. And then we're gonna add in some button art too because this bright yellow button is really, really ugly. So let's find a button image. And here I've got another one that I generated with Midjourney, and you can download in the description, just named Button, and I think this looks quite a bit better. So we're gonna modify our button to look like this. To do that, we need to go to our button object here under the canvas, not the text on it, but the button object, and then modify the image here. That's got our sprite, so we take our button and drag it on. Again, if you can't drag it on, make sure that it's in sprite mode, not in default mode. Now this is here, and it kind of looks right, but it's very yellowish, right, or kind of green. The reason for that is that we have this tint color. And if we have just a solid white thing, it can usually tint to okay, but things that have any kind of texture to them generally don't tint very well by just changing the color. So we change this back to white and things look quite a bit better. Now my text doesn't look right, but before I resize the text, let's make sure the button is the right size. I'm gonna hit the set native size button so that the actual size here matches exactly with our button. And I don't like that it's so small and when I say with our button, it matches with the actual dimensions of our button's image. It's 582 pixels wide, 174 high, and that's what we've got here, 582 and 174. I want this to be twice as big though, so I'm just going to double this. I'm going to do times 2, whoops, not times 23, and times 2. Now I've got a nice big button that I can move down to this bottom right corner and then shrink the text on. So hold Alt and Shift and hit the dock button right here. We click up here, hold Alt and Shift, and hit the dock to move it right there, the bottom right. Maybe we can go bottom middle, bottom left, anywhere along the side that we want, or the bottom right where I actually wanted it to be. Next, we'll adjust this text. It's way too big. It's filling out a lot more space than it needs to, and I've got a couple options for that. One, I could just turn off auto size, and I could just kind of change it to fit exactly how I want, or two, I could leave auto size on and add in some anchors to these sides. I could leave auto size on and put in maybe like 50, or that's not enough, 100 pixels to the left and 100 pixels to the right. But now you can see that it's actually trying to overflow into a new line. So I have to make one more change to it and turn off wrapping so that overflow is disabled. Now it'll fill it in and put it all into this single line here. But the other option would be to make it shorter by adjusting the top and bottom. But I think just having it here in one line makes, uh, makes sense by turning off the wrapping. Now let's change our vertex color to white. I think that that, oh, maybe I want like a little bit of a green, a lighter green like that. And then I think we're just about done because the button is already hooked up. If we look at our button, since we duplicated this thing, it's actually going to reload right here in our reload button script, but there's gonna be one issue. So let's save, let's add our build or our scene to our build settings. So go file and build settings and we'll add this open scene. We wanna drag it up to the top so that it's the first in our scene. So that, that way when we do a build, start will be called first. And then we wanna save. We'll press play and then let's click on that button and guess what's gonna happen? If you have a good idea after all we've done so far, drop it in the comments below and let me know that you figured it out. If not, then get ready, let's watch and see. So we click the button and hey, we're back at the start menu. Why are we back at the start menu? Well, if you remember close, remember what we were doing, think about it closely, look at this reload button script. Our reload button script loads scene zero. What level should it load? Um, you probably got it. Guess it in the comments if you want. It's one. We'll put a one there, and now our game is going to work. But before we press play and prove that it works, let's take a look at the data one more time and see why that is. Why is it that changing it to a one makes sense and having it as a zero no longer makes sense? Well, if we go to file and we go to build settings, we've got our build setting indexes right here, or our scenes and build with their indexes, and one is level one now, two is level two, three is game over, and zero is start. We can add in as many levels as we want and have our game just go all the way through them and our players can try to get all the way to the end and see if they win. 
Now that we've got our core game done, my recommendation to you is that you experiment a little bit. Try adding some different levels, pull in some different art, and try just changing things up a little bit in code and a little bit in the inspector. Once you're satisfied with that and you've gotten a little bit bored, move on to another tutorial and then do one more tutorial after that. Then start to think about things that you can mix and match between these tutorials. You're gonna find that things that you've learned in one game development session will totally apply to other game development development sessions, or maybe will inspire you to do different things that you hadn't thought of and give you new ways to think about programming and putting games together. All right, if this was helpful for you, please leave a comment down below and let me know or just hit that thumbs up button. And if you want to learn some of the more advanced stuff, you're always welcome to go check out my courses at game.courses where we go a lot deeper into really long in-depth coursework and tutorials on this stuff with quizzes and tests and all that stuff. All right, don't forget to subscribe, check out more tutorials, and keep making games.